Um, okay. Just so you know, we're live. Okay. All right. Leader. Yeah. Doug, I'm just holding on for a second here to see um, who's coming on over here for attendees. I'm, I'm watching for Amherst Media. There they are. All right. Okay. So we're, we're good to go, right? Yes. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 20th, 2021. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media, and minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The, the Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately ac access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive rec record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here, uh, present. Tom Long. Present. Uh, Andrew McDougall is absent. Uh, Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And I am here. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please raise your hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. If appropriate, public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you, are, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda this evening is minutes. And we have a number of minutes that are ready for review and approval. Uh, they are for July 7th, July 14th, August 4th, August 25th, September 1st, and October 6th. And I would like to again thank all the board members and the staff that have worked so hard to get us these minutes and to try to get caught up on our minute minute taking. All right, so um, let's see. All right. Uh, so Chris, would you like us to try to move these as one uh, collection of minutes or do you, should do we need to go through each one individually? I think you should go through each one individually. Um, I only received one set of comments, which is from Janet on the first set of minutes and I sent them to um, Pam, so she has those. 
but I think it would be good to go through them individually. All right. So why don't we start with the July 7th minutes? We'll do them chronologically. Um, do I have a motion to, uh, to approve those minutes? I see Johanna, Johanna's name. You raised your hand. I'll move to approve the minutes from July 7th. All right, do we have a second? I'll second. All right, uh, any comments on the July 7th minutes? Janet sent in comments, which Pam can show on the screen if she can be so kind. I think can it's page, page nine. Yeah. We're done. Can you see them? They're in red. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Would you like Janet to read her um, suggested additions? Sure. Janet, would you mind doing that? So um, this is the when we were talking about the Mitchell Farm property and whether um, we, the planning board should recommend to the town council to buy the property because it was coming out of 61A um, agricultural use. And, um, and so, so it, it, I guess basically the first sentence says that McGowan said there's no information about the land itself and they have no basis to make a recommendation. And Jack said something. And then I added um, that what we know is that the, it is farmland. It has a river and two or three streams actually not street streams and wetlands and is a floodplain. We don't know anything about its ecological importance, agricultural importance. The planning board has no basis to make a decision other than Mr. Reedy's statements. And, um, and then later on, I talked about the master plan um, because there was a talk about, you know, part of a strategic plan. And I, so I said, master plan is the task of for creating an inventory of farmland and priorities and creating a strategic strategic plan for protection. Is there a strategic plan and can we see it? The Conservation Commission and Farm Committee should weigh in on this land. Um, and so that's just a correction. Um, okay. Are there other changes you would request? Is there any on the next page or any other pages? No, and I, I think just ch change the word streets to streams and I think we're good. So. Okay. Do but you I wanna make a motion to amend the minutes, Janet? I'd like to make a motion to amend the minutes with the corrections I've stated. Uh, do we have anyone that would like to second that? I think that's Jack. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't see your hand raised. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, does anybody want to talk about the, the, this uh, edit at all? Any discussion? Or shall we just vote on Janet's amendments? All right. Um, so I'll go through the, the members. Uh, Janet? Aye. Aye. Uh, Maria? Approve. Jack? Aye. Tom? Aye. Johanna? Aye. All right, the uh, amendments are approved. And then let's have a vote on these July 7th minutes. Maria. Uh, approve. Janet. Approve. Jack. Uh, approve. Tom. Approve. Johanna. Approve. And then I, I approve as well. And I also vote in favor of the amendment. All right, so that's the July 7th minutes. Next, we have the July 14th amendment uh, minutes. Uh, do we have anyone to move the approval of those? 
So moved. All right, thank you, Jack. Uh, and I saw Tom's hand move a little bit. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Uh, any discussion on the July 14th minutes? Janet? So um, I read these minutes and I'm this, I recall this as like a five hour meeting that we had. And um, I didn't read through, I didn't listen to the whole meeting again, but from the start, I, you know, um, when we we're looking at the zoning priorities, we talked to, um, it says Ms. McGowan was displeased with the process of amendment review and feels rushed. And then um, there's a long list of Christine, Christine, Ms. Brestrup's statements. Um, and I went back and listened to that because I remember that meeting, that section really differently. And it's four minutes of me talking about very specific issues I had with the process. And I just felt like it disappeared. Um, and then, and I, I just, I basically, I think it'd be great to put these to the side and kind of go through them again, because um, as I went through it, there was another, period of time where um, basically for seven minutes, I had raised a bunch of issues with um, the apartments amendment and Maureen Pollack and I had to this seven minute back and forth that was really detailed with lots of points and Maureen disappeared from it. And um, and so I, would, I, I was hoping we could just put these to the side and maybe I could look at a transcript of it to get a better sense because I, as I went through it, I just saw like it was, I think they're too thin and don't really reflect the discussion that had. Um, part of it is, you know, I know I'm a minority viewpoint on the committee and I'm often asking more detailed questions. And I just think it, you know, somebody would read these minutes and not understand what the full discussion was and, and not to create a transcript, but not to remove entire sections. So that would be my request that we just push the, move these, move these aside and um, I don't know if there's a transcript or you could, if maybe um, Pam can send me that weird link. I don't know if it's from Zoom or YouTube, I can't remember, but I just felt like huge sections were out. And then um, I felt like just saying I'm displeased and I feel rushed was sort of trivializing my concerns. And I don't, I'm sure you don't wanna do that. Thank you, thank you, Janet. Chris, I see your hand. Um, I wanted to say that, um, it would be helpful if Janet were to take that on and to um, try to reconstruct what she said and what she uh, what she feels um, happened that night because we're already struggling with other minutes and um, we don't want to get further behind. So if Janet sends us language that she would like inserted in the minutes, we'd be happy to bring them back to you next time. All right. Well, we do have a motion on the floor to approve the minutes. Um, does anybody object to, uh, I don't know what we would do parliamentary wise, um, to, to delaying these or do, do people feel they want to proceed and approve them as they are tonight? You know, uh, I see a thumbs up from Jack. I see a hand up from Johanna. Why don't you speak? Thank you. Um, where are we at with the open meetings complaint and is there any potential harm that comes from you know delaying these until our next meeting with that regard uh chris do you want to answer that i don't think there would be any harm i've answered both open meeting law complaints and i've told the complaint complainants what the status of the um minutes is and and I said that we would post drafts as they became available and I think the draft of this meeting was posted and so um, I think we're probably good for now we've got a holding pattern so we can bring these back next time with um, more um, with edits whatever Janet, Janet yeah. wants to add okay we'll put those aside Moving on to the August 4th minutes. Uh, Johanna, is that a legacy hand or do you want to move the August 4th, four minutes? I'll move the August 4th minutes. Excellent. Anybody want a second? I'm seeing Janet's hand. Are you seconding Janet? Yes, second, sorry. All right, thank you. All right, uh, so we have a motion to approve the August 4 minutes. Any discussion? 
no discussion. All right, so in that case, I'll do a roll call. Maria? Approved. Uh, Janet? Janet, I have muted you. Sorry, approved. Thank you, Jack. Aye. Tom. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And then I'm an I. Okay, next August 25th minutes. Somebody want to move the August 25th minutes? <laughs> Gosh, okay. All right, thanks, Tom, for raising your hand. Let's let's record that Tom Long raised his Ooh. hand and okay, Jack, I'll recognize you as seconding. Second, yes. All right. Any discussion of the August 25th minutes? Not seeing any hands. All right, another roll call. Maria. Approve. Janet. I think we're fighting the unmute unmutes. Approve. <laughs> Thank you. Jack? Uh, aye. Tom? Approve. And Johanna? Approve. And I'm going to approve as well. All right. Next, we have the September 1st minutes. Why don't I move those just for, for fun? Uh, do we have any seconds? I see Tom's hand raised as a second to the second. September 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 first minutes. Any discussion of those minutes? See no hands. Uh, all right, roll call. Maria. Approve. Janet, tonight you're second, at least based on where the Hollywood squares are on my screen. <laughs> I'll second. Thank you, Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. And Johanna. Approve. And I'm an approve as well of the September 1st minutes. Finally, we have, I believe, the October 6th minutes. All right, somebody else needs to move these tonight. All right, thanks, Tom. Top move by Tom Long. All right, I see a thumbs up from Jack as a second. Yes. Thank you. Any discussion? No discussion. Roll call. Maria. Approve. Janet. Approve. Jack. Approve. Tom. Approve. And Johanna. Approve. And I'm an approve as well. So we have moved five sets of minutes. Uh, all of them with the exception of July 14th. All right, <clears throat> so we'll now move on to the second item the, in, in the agenda, which is the public comment period. The time is 6.50 p.m. Uh, I'll remind the public that uh, comments that you can make during this period cannot be related to uh, the items on our agenda. So they cannot be related to 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. They cannot be related to the Podic and Cole Conservation Area, nor to the zoning bylaw change related to mixed use buildings um, or the uh, rezoning of map 14A, parcel 33. Um, and so do we have other public comment that relates to topics I have not just named. All right, it looks like we have 18, maybe 13 attendees. Okay, Jay Silver, Silverstein, uh, why don't we let him speak? He's got his hand raised. Pam? Hello, Jay. Can you unmute? I certainly can. Hi, Jay. <clears throat> Basically, uh, I don't understand how you could vote to change the zoning uh, for a parking structure in the- Jay, Jay yeah. we're, we're not talking about that topic now. This is public comment about things that are not on the agenda. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Withdraw. All right. And Ronnie Parker. Uh, okay. Hi. Sorry. Hi. I was also talking about the same thing that Jay was going to talk about because it is not on the agenda as far as I can see. But if it is on the agenda, then I'll wait. Thank you. Yes, it's item five. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. And then Dorothy Pam, please uh, state your name and your address. I'm sorry. I forgot for the first two. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Just for clarification, uh, when these items are discussed on the agenda, will there be a public comment period after that? Uh, I believe the answer is yes. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it on the agenda. I'm looking at the agenda and I don't, well, I see one right now and I don't see another. So I just want to make sure that people who are here to um, make a comment on those items will in fact be allowed to speak. Yes, they will be allowed to speak. Okay, and then my other question to you is given the rush of zoning things, uh, what items were you anticipating that the public might comment on beside these items? Because maybe- well, this, we is a, this is a, an open forum that we have every week. Uh, they could speak about anything related to the kind of jurisdiction that the planning board has. It could be about the master plan. It could be, you know, it could be about a sign for all I know. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty much open. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Okay, um, so we'll, I guess that'll be it for the public comment period. All right, so now we'll go to the third item on the agenda. And this is a public hearing for the pro, for a preliminary subdivision plan. Uh, the time is 654. And this item was on the agenda as item number three. It's expected to start at 635. This is SUB. 2022-01, uh, 11-13 East Pleasant Street, Archipelago Investments, LLC, continued from August 25th, September 29th, and October 20th, or and tonight is the 20th. So um, request approval for a two lot preliminary subdivision plan under Mass General Law Chapter 41, sections 81L and 81S. Um, Chris, do you want to introduce this? Uh, yeah, this um, has been on the agenda of the planning board since uh, August 25th. That's when the public hearing was opened. And then it was continued to September 29th. And then it was continued again until tonight. So we have a letter from um, Archipelago Investments. Dear planning board members, I'm writing to request that the planning board further extend the 45 day review period for preliminary subdivision plan SUB 2022-01 and continue the public hearing on this application from October 20th to December 1st, 2021. And, All right, so I, I, do we need to vote to continue this again? Yes. Okay, so first I see Janet's hand, Janet. I just have a quick question is, um, are they proceeding with building 11 East Pleasant Street? Can they? Can we have this hearing open and they can start construction? Is there any relationship between those two? I'm a little. Are they going to start building this, or do you have any? Is okay. There some, any? I think I think Chris can answer that question. Chris, I think they're a long way from starting to build this. They need to get their um, decisions from the planning board, which I wrote to you about this afternoon. There are four at least four decisions that need to get signed and filed with the town clerk. And then they uh, probably need to, um, you know, solidify their financing and do uh, construction drawings and get building permits from the building commissioner. And so they're, in my opinion, uh, a long way from constructing anything there. But in any event, I don't think that the um, preliminary subdivision plan application um, necessarily relates to that topic, um, or it doesn't directly relate to that topic. 
um, other than to say that if they proceed with their preliminary subdivision plan, um, they may get some protection from uh, zoning amendments that have been passed. And I think that, um, so that's probably in the back of their minds right now. Uh, but it certainly is something that can kind of go parallel with whatever's going on with the planning board right now. And I don't imagine they're going to be building anything anytime soon. All right. Uh, are there any other questions or comments about this? Uh, otherwise, we will do a roll call for continuing this public hearing. Uh, we will need a date certain, I believe, Chris. Uh, and what date did they request again? They have requested December 1st, and that is um, a regular planning board night. So that's a good night to continue to. And you could say 635 on December 1st. All right. All right. So we need a motion to continue this public hearing to December 1st at 635. I'm seeing Janet's hand. Is that you are making that motion? I so move. Thank you. Anybody want a second? Thank Johanna, you. Johanna, I see your hand. I'll second. Thank you. All right. Any discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call again. Maria? Approve. Thank you. Janet? Approve. Jack? Aye. Tom? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So that's six in favor and one absent. All right, that's the end of that item on the agenda. We'll move to the fourth item on the agenda, which is a new public hearing. Um, all right, I think, believe I have a preamble to read for that. Yes, okay. So the time is 6.59, and in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-04, Town of Amherst, Podick and Cole Conservation Areas, Route 116. Request site plan review approval under section 3.335, or sections 3.335, 7.9, and 8.5 of the zoning bylaw to construct a new 13 space parking area, including two accessible spaces and adjacent loading zones, and to install appropriate signage for access to the Podick and Cole conservation areas Map 2C, Parcel 1, R O, Zoning District. Are there, is there any board disclosure for this hearing? I see none. All right, who do we have presenting this uh, topic, Chris? Uh, I see Rob's hand. Rob, maybe you'll do the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, Pam, please, if you can go ahead and put up the uh, slides, that'd be great. Um, this is another project by the Conservation Department uh, in the continued effort to improve uh, both visibility and safety at the uh, parking for parking at uh, conservation areas and trail access points. Um, if you can go to the there we go. So here's a uh, locust plan. This this particular location in North Amherst is. Uh, right around the intersection of Sunderland Road and Route 116. Uh, there's uh, approximately 120 acres of townland uh, abutting Hadley Conservation. Hold on one second. All right, so the recording resumed. I clicked, I, I, I suppose it's possible I clicked recording pause, but. Well, I'm glad that you caught it. Okay. It, so, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. And Rob, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. No problem. Uh, hold on, Rob. Here we are. Okay, so here's here's the property again. Uh, about 120 acres of town conservation land, uh, budding Hadley conservation land. 
uh, including both uh, the podic and coal conservation areas and uh, trails. Um, next uh, slide, please, Pam. Yes. Uh, here on the, the left top corner, uh, zoomed in uh, location plan, the red is where we are going to propose the parking area. Uh, the gray shown there off perpendicular 116 is an existing gravel road that, that goes into the property, uh, turns to the south where the red block is and continues into the property in a very uh, informal gravel road uh, path. Uh, that is seen better on the lower image. I'm not sure if Cam if you're able to zoom in a little bit on that, but that's the existing conditions down on the bottom left corner. Uh, just a, a paved apron that ends and turns into a, a sandy gravel uh, 12 foot wide uh, driveway access. Uh, straight ahead to the right there where the, the field, where you can see the field and these, those wooden planks, uh, that's where the parking is, is going to be proposed uh, for anyone who was out on a site visit. Uh, so moving right into the center, our proposed uh, parking plan. Uh, the hatched area down the middle is the existing sandy gravel driveway. Uh, we're looking to widen that uh, to about 18 feet wide and install uh, 13 parking spaces uh, with two accessible marked spaces in, in the, um, the associated loading zone to the side of those spaces, uh, uh, space one and space 13. Uh, this is a, a shared parking for two conservation area. So there will be, you know, the idea is that you'd, you'd either go one or the other direction or perhaps both, but uh, that's why we separated the accessible spaces. And you'll see uh, there's a kiosk located at each of the uh, north and south points of the parking lot. Uh, that'll provide some information about the conservation area and directional uh, uh, materials for the trail access. Uh, this is, uh, for anyone that remembers, uh, the last application out on Bay Road or has seen that project. Uh, this is a gravel parking area. Uh, it'll be completed with uh, trap rock gravel, TRG. Uh, there's an image of the uh, completed uh, Sweet Owls parking on Bay Road. Uh, so it's a hard pack material. It gets rolled, compacted tightly. Uh, and then the finer materials used for the parking area and access to the kiosks if necessary. Uh, we did some experimenting with striping, although I've asked for the waiver again, as I did on this, this lot on Bay Road. Uh, we did some experimenting with painting. Uh, it worked okay. Uh, it, it lasts about three weeks uh, before it needs to be redone. Uh, it was, it was uh, well received, I'd say. So I, you know, we ended up going out and painting again. So I think we're going to, uh, you know, try to make that part of our, our regular program, our routine to, to every three, four weeks go around and, and spray the lines again, uh, because it seemed to be uh, worth that effort. Uh, you know, this parking lot and, and um, another parking lot on Stanley Street that we improved, um, you know, I've seen the parking work really well and, and you know, in the, in the layout and design that we were hoping for. Uh, so we can go back to the uh, plan pan, please. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there's a couple of signs. Uh, or there's a kiosk, uh, you know, that's various uh, typical kiosks. The conservation department uses at all their conservation areas. So there'll be two of those. That's in the top right corner. Uh, the two of those will be installed. And then uh, lower down uh, beneath that is a image of a Typical wood, wood post uh, and a, that'll support a hanging sign, which will be more like the image on the very bottom. Uh, they're still finalizing the, uh, the size and color of these signs, but you know we're pretty sure they're gonna be something like this bottom image, although none of them have been installed yet. Uh, so this is um, gravel parking lot, uh, 13 spaces. Uh, we are um, hoping to get this installed this, uh, this late this fall uh, before the weather changes. Uh, and I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the next item would be, do we have a site visit report? Um, and uh, Chris, do you want to say something? 
We don't have a written site visit report, so maybe one of the uh, planning board members who was at the site visit could report. <laughs> and there's only so, one here. <laughs> so since I'm the only one that was present, uh, I did meet Chris and, and Andrew McDougall at the site yesterday about 5.15. Uh, if you look at that photo in the lower left that's shown at the moment, uh, we parked behind that photo, you know, behind the photographer of that photo. Uh, but then we walked down that road and the light colored area that's Kind of to the right of the of the gravel road is a an area of wooden mats, uh, and that uh, at least Chris described that as being kind of where the parking would start, um, and then it would proceed a little farther into the distance. Um, you know, we didn't have a long site visit. Uh, we did talk about how bright the sunlight was because it was pretty late in the afternoon, and we were all none of us could really look to the west uh, without being blinded. <laughs> uh, we did. We did note that the road continues farther uh, onto private property uh, and off off of this conservation land. And there was a, a a walking path at the end of that road that that headed south. Uh, Chris, do you think I missed anything from our conversation? I do not think so. No. Okay. Yeah, it was a pretty pretty short conversation. All right, so questions from the board. Tom. So I, I just wanted to comment that the design review board had looked at this and um, approved it with the same, um, as long as it matched the um, existing conditions or the planned conditions for um, Sweet Alice in terms of the road sign, which is not currently there yet, um, which we heard was under construction. Um, but as long as it met those criteria that this was approved by the Design Review Board unanimously. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Janet? Um, this, isn't, this is somewhat related. Um, how often do trails in our conservation area get cut? Because um, my sons during the pandemic went down the Podex side and it was really nice, but they came back with like, and the dogs came back with like 6 million ticks. And I just wondered, is there like, is it once a year or twice a year? Or is it more often? I just never, I've always wondered this. Are they uh, on a regular schedule? Thank you. Rob, do you have an answer to that? Uh, I, I don't know the intervals. I do know we have, uh, you know, one, uh, two full-time staff that are dedicated to uh, maintenance of all the conservation areas, not just the trails. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it's more than once a year. I'd be surprised if it was. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions from the board? All right. To Rob, I had one question, which was if you, what, what are you using for doing the striping that you might be doing once a month for years to come? And, and would we have an accumulation of vinyl latex on the property because of the, you know, the white paint that's getting applied repeatedly? Yeah, it's, a, it's an aerosol spray, uh, upright spray can that uh, runs in a, uh, a cart. Uh, so it uh, barely covers the stone, as you can imagine. It does more blowing around than anything else. Uh, but uh, we've been able to get it to um, at least uh, be visible. Uh, the, the, we talked to companies that provide uh, the various types of striping for parking areas or pavement. And uh, because of the high pressure that's involved, um, it, it wouldn't leave a, a, a visible print at all. So um, it takes, for that Sweet Owls Park, it took two spray cans to, um, if that helps you, <laughs> with that question to uh to paint the uh, parking area uh-huh so so far as you know there's no concern about accumulation of that product on the on the parking lot no and would you be doing it once a month all year round or just during the summer season or something we'll just be doing it during the peak seasons i see okay all right Is there any further questions from the board? I don't don't see any. Okay, Johanna. Good 
I guess I also have a question about the striping because um, initially the thinking was if we paint the parking lots and get people habituated um, in using kind of the pattern that the plant town had intended that we would be able to abandon that. Um, Rob, can you just expand a little bit more into the experience at Sweet Alice and what is making you think that it's worth both like, you know, I don't know the, I guess I'm thinking like the town's precious staff resources to go and, you know, sounds like now we would be spraying three parking lots monthly at Sweet Alice and Stanley Street and at this site. And I don't know if there are additional parking lot improvements in place, but it seems, I don't know, it seems like a lot of um, labor to maintain, I guess. Uh, yeah, so you're exactly right, Johanna, that we, the, the plan was to uh, use the, the markings to try to get, um, you know, get some consistency in the parking and hope that we wouldn't have to continue it. That's why I've asked for the waivers, because long term, I don't think it's going to continue. Uh, but uh, when we put it down on Sweet Alice, um, it was, uh, like I said, it was well received. It was asked for again. Uh, I, I, there was an event at the uh, Kestrel property and we went out and sprayed it again. It takes about, I'd say, eight to 10 minutes to respray, you know, the, after we've done the initial marking and have the layout, it's really quick, two cans uh, of spray paint. Um, I don't think we'll be doing it forever, uh, but we'll probably do it next season uh, and, and continue uh, till people get used to using these parking areas. All right, thanks, Rob. Uh, not seeing any more hands from the board. Uh, are there any public comments on this topic regarding this conservation property? All right, I don't see any public comment. All right, uh, in that case, uh, why don't we have a vote? Uh, do a, does anybody want to move that the board uh, approve the site plan review application? Johanna? I'll move to approve the site plan review application. All right, and Tom? I second. Thank you. Chris, I see your hand. Oh, just to remind you all to include closing the public hearing and um, meets the relevant criteria of 11.24. And did you have any conditions that you wanted to impose? Uh, can you remind us whether we had conditions on the, uh, the Bay Road property? I don't have that in front of me, but I think you might have said build according to plan. That's a typical one that you put in. Okay. Can we simply reference the identical condi conditions yeah. of that mm -hmm. of that previous uh, approval? Yes. All right. So I'm seeing Johanna. You are nodding in agreement to that clarification of your motion, and Tom's nodding as well. So we we will vote to close the public hearing. Approve the site plan review application with the same conditions as previously uh, imposed on Bay Road. And I think that covers the motion. 11.24. Oh yes, and th that we find that it's in conformance with 11.24. All right, are we all set? Uh, roll call, Maria. Approved. Thank you. Uh, Jack, you're next now. Uh, aye. Tom. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Thank you all. Doug. Yes. What is oh, your yeah, I'm, I'm an aye too. Thank you, Pam. Welcome. Okay, so we have closed that public hearing. That's the fourth item on our agenda. The time is now 7.17 and we will uh, reopen a public hearing that was previously continued to this date. So 
So this is the uh, proposal to uh, modify the zoning for map 14A, parcel 33 on North Prospect Street. To see if the town will vote to amend to the official zoning map to change the zoning of map 14A, parcel 33 to add a parking facility overlay district over the underlying existing RG zoning district and to establish dimensional regulations, standards, and conditions, and to require a parking management operations and maintenance plan to include a vacant parcel of land currently used as a parking lot owned by town of Amherst in the vicinity of North Pleasant Street, North Prospect Street, Coles Lane, and Amity Street, located in the general residence district. All right. Uh, so we've reopened this public hearing. Uh, the applicant, uh, Nate, are you making the pr presentation this evening? I am. Thanks, Doug. All right. Why don't you go ahead? Sure. So this is a continuation of the hearing. Um, uh, you know, the uh, I'll share my screen. And, um, you know, just to let the uh, let the planning board know and everyone else know the the CRC, the Community Resource Committee is taking this up next week. And, you know, we're presenting here tonight to ask the planning board to either recommend this or, you know, have a further discussion and then um, if, if no recommendation tonight, then you know we can schedule a time soon to continue the discussion. And so here's the existing conditions of the property. This was discussed last time. It's um, about um, 0.68 acres. It's now 97% covered with pavement as a surface lot. There's approximately 75 parking spaces um, and there's very little setbacks um, except for the front off North Prospect Street. And you know, for this for this um, for this evening, we we presented the zoning district as it would appear as a formal amendment. So last time we were here, it was um, you know in text form, but not as a bylaw, um, a formal amendment. So there haven't been significant changes. I was going to make some clarifications. Um, so as as an overlay district, uh, is my is my is the word document visible for everyone? Yes, it is. I can yeah, see so this, this, this would, thanks Doug, this would change article two um, zoning districts and use regulations, article three. And so um, within article two, we have a listing of special districts. And so this would become, um, you know, section 2.04 as the parking facility district. And it would be described as an overlay district that applies only to the municipal lot 14A-33. So that's one section of the bylaw that would be amended. And then Article 3, the use regulations. Uh, there's actually, a there had been a section 3.23 that was omitted um, and it's a vacant section. So this parking facility district would then occupy this section. And, you know, it would, it would have a number of sections here, a purpose to allow the development of a public or private parking facility. Um, it would only apply to um, this property, it's an overlay district. So it's, um, you know, the underlying zoning, the general residence doesn't change. And that would um, regulate all other uses other than a parking facility. Um, you know, and the overlay really does apply just to two sections of the use chart. So 3.3840, which is a commercial parking lot or garage, and 3.3841, which is a public parking lot or garage. Uh, there's uh, its own dimensional standards, which would replace section 6.17 and table three. So there's no uh, minimum lot area if you know a parking facility was um, chosen, um, um, no frontage. The frontage zone we're defining as 15 feet between the property line along the right of way and the closest point to any structure or parking space. Um, side or rear setbacks. It's five feet from prop the property line abutting a residential use in a residential district. Otherwise, no setback is required. A maximum build building coverage of 90%, maximum lot coverage of 95%, and a maximum height of 40 feet um, measured as the vertical distance from the average finished grade 
on the street side of the structure, which is typically how we define um, where the starting point is. And we're saying to the highest point of the parking structure, including a parapet wall or a screen um, that's on top of the uppermost parking level. And the height does not apply to stairs, elevator towers, or mechanical equipment. And there has been some comments about this, and I just wanted to add a clarification. Previously, I said that you know there's seven or eight feet to a parking garage. Um, that's headroom height, that's floor to ceiling. Um, and then there's the structure uh, itself that may have two or three feet of, of material to support the decks. And then given you know, a 1% or 1.5% 1 .1 slope to a parking garage and a few hundred feet, that's another few feet. So typically a parking structure doesn't have a level floor and it's really 10 to 12 feet per, per deck level. So um, you know, for staff, 40 feet measured in this way really applies to, you know, helps measure the height of a parking structure. The, the way we measure height in the bylaw now couldn't really apply to a parking garage, um, you know, closely enough. So 40 feet is, you know, is something we felt, uh, you know, is compatible with the district, the surrounding neighborhood, and it sets a, a height that, you know, an applicant would have to meet, right? So um, they could configure, they could figure out how to, um, shape the parking levels and everything to, mat, to meet that height. And so none of this has changed from the previous presentation. Um, staff does not think we have to have a setback. You know, in many properties, there are no setbacks from property lines. In the BEG, it's um, not required. And so um, we think that this is still um, appropriate for this overlay. And even given the maximum lot coverage of 95%, it's still slightly less than the existing condition. In terms of standards and conditions, um, you know, the permit granting authority would still be a site plan review application. Um, the design review principles would need to be applied, would be required to be applied. Uh, the design standards and landscape standards of section 7.1 of the zoning bylaw would be applied. And then the site plan re review criteria. Um, you know, these conditions are relatively the same so, you know, we would, um, you know, we're saying here that the permit granting authority um, could ask the applicant to um, provide studies at their cost and peer review of traffic impact analysis. And so, you know, right now we don't know what size garage, the number of parking spaces that could be proposed. And so that's up to an applicant. And so then it's on their, it's, you know, it's their um, responsibility to show how they can mitigate for that. and. Um, the impacts that could have. We still have the parking structure shall be designed to be compatible with the adjacent neighborhood in downtown. Uh, the parking structure shall be designed and our facade treatments shall be applied to minimize the visibility of cars parked inside the facility from North Prospect Street. And so, you know, these two, um, and the next one, architectural details and materials shall be used to break down the scale of the parking structure facade. So the, the three conditions here are really meant to guide the permit granting authority during an application review. So, you know, there's been comments about having a solid wall on North Prospect Street. Um, you know, the, ta the stair tower should be away from the street. And so as an overlay zone, we're not getting that prescriptive in terms of design guidelines. That's something that the planning board could ask during permitting. You could ask the applicant to have an alternative site plan that has the stair tower away from the street. You could ask them to show different types of facade material. Um, you know, typically a garage is not a solid wall because then the venting required in it is really extensive and expensive. And so it could be that the planning board or the permit granting authority asked that, you know, all the parking decks have a four foot wall, a solid wall up to a certain height to block headlights when they're inside the garage. But staff believes all that could be discussed during permitting and doesn't need to be written into uh, the overlay. Um, there's still the section 3.2344 that discusses the grade of the entry drive. Um, you know, it has width and um, really, you know, E says at least one vehicle shall queue on the property without blocking the sidewalk. That's something that was in there. Um, it's something that we think, you know, will help at least uh, get cars out of the public way. Um, the frontage zone shall be heavily landscaped with plants, having a height of at least one story above grade at the time of planting 
Um, and this has been changed right here in addition to other low level plantings and ground cover. And so, you know, that's an addition from the last time just to help uh, clarify the types of plants. I did notice actually that sustainable design objectives should be uh, called out as its own, um, as its own uh, standard. So that has to be renumbered. Um, again, we're not saying exactly what that means. It's something that could be discussed in terms of, is it, you know, how the materials they're using? Is it their site design? Um, you know, we want to allow some flexibility here without knowing uh, what the future could be. Uh, this could also mean electrical vehicle charging stations. It could mean more uh, bike racks to allow different modes of transportation. And so without, you know, being overly prescriptive, this is something that can guide uh, the permitting. You know, again, the continuous sidewalks, um, you know, we're not asking an applicant to bring sidewalks um, outside the site, but make connections to existing pathways and walkways along with Prospect Street. Um, lighting should be installed in, in downlit to prevent disbursement onto adjacent properties. Um, and we did qualify the freestanding sign. So um, we're still allowing additional freestanding or projecting, projecting signs that do not ex exceed 50 square feet each uh, for a combined total of 100 square feet uh, may be installed in accordance with um, Article 8. So, you know, previously we just, we didn't have this 50 square feet. So we're limiting a sign to 50 square feet. And again, this is something that can be discussed during permitting. And then we're requiring a parking management operations and maintenance plan. And this would be submitted at the time of application. It would include the number of parking spaces and the intended users, um, rates and fees, hours of operation, safety measures such as lighting or security cameras, signs, um, enforcement operations uh, such as ticketing or towing, trash removal, uh, snow management, treatment and maintenance of interior surfaces, and stormwater management. Um, this is an, an exhaustive list, but it's, you know, again, meant to guide an applicant in the review um, during permitting. And so, you know, this is one step to have an overlay to allow the possibility of a parking facility on this property. Um, if this were to move forward, the town would then need to issue a, a request for proposals. And so some of the comments we've received in terms of um, uh, specific elements of the project could be required in the request for proposals as part of a long-term lease or other conditions of the property. Um, but staff doesn't necessarily think they're appropriate in the zoning overlay. So, you know, there could be certain elements in terms of a ratio of bike racks to parking spaces or certain sign elements that would go in a request for a proposal, but is not really um, necessary in the overlay zoning amendment. All right, Nate, are you, is that the end of it? That's the end of it. Okay. So why don't we just get started with the discussion? I will say that I guess, Chris, am I right that the CRC will have a hearing on this uh, October 26th? Is that right? That's correct. Yep. Okay. It's in so the afternoon. So it's two o'clock in the afternoon or sometime around then for people who might want to come from the public. Thank you. So it probably would be a good idea for us to vote on this uh, this evening, you know, up or down at least, whether we want to uh, recommend or not recommend at this time. That's correct. Um, so let, let's try to keep that as a goal for the discussion. And um, do we have a board conversation about this? Anybody want to speak to or ask questions of Nate? Uh, Janet, I see your hand. Thank you. And thank you, Nate, um, for this presentation. Um, has there been any massing study done for this um, parking garage, its potential build out? Um, I know we've done, the planning department has done that in response to requests from the planning boards for several zoning amendments this year. And I think it would be really helpful for us to see what this building would look like in relationship to the buildings around it, just to see how big it is or how small it is, that kind of thing. And so 
I had asked for that um, in an email. Um, has that been done? Uh, Chris or Nate, have you got any comments about that? That has not been done, no. But we did okay. show an image of the um, garage from Greenfield and um, gave a sense of you know, how big a garage might be on this property. But we're not designing a garage now. So um, we didn't think that it was necessary to provide a three-dimensional massing study. OK. Nate, did you want to say anything? No, I was going to just mention that the Greenfield garage is something we had shown previously in terms of a, a potential massing. OK. All right, so we don't have that information for this evening's conversation. Right. Uh, uh, Janet, did you raise your, your, your physical hand? Yeah, I have several questions. So we have done a massing study for the B overlay zone. We've had several of those for the 40B, for footnote M and moving the BL into footnote B. And all of those were super helpful to the planning board because we got to see what the consequences of a zoning change were. And so I, I think we should, we need that before we can make a recommendation. I think okay. the CRC could benefit from it. And then I also think that um, members of the public and the town councils would benefit from that. So it seems odd to me to go forward without at least a simple massing study, com you know, comparing the size of the parking garage in relationship to St. Bridges, the CVS, the houses across the street, it seemed, and Strong House and the library. So we do that all the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria. Uh, thanks. I um, Thanks for that, Nate. I, I, it's nice to see it all sort of organized and distilled. Uh, it looks good. It looks just like what you just showed us previously. Um, the comment about a lot of people asking for studies and why we've done many studies in the past. Um, I keep wanting to um, say it, but I haven't had an opportunity. So all those massing studies done previously by town staff were because we were studying a lot of different parcels in a lot of different zones of a lot of different neighborhoods. And it was necessary to just kind of get a sense of like what happens on the largest parcels, what might happen on a few typical parcels. Because, you know, no private developer or no one on the planning board can um, come and do that except for, you know, town staff who have that sort of ability and resources. Um, what this amendment doing is literally asking for that for the next step. It's literally saying, please provide us with studies, with traffic studies, with all these um, uh, you know, options for what could be there. Um, that's literally the next step. So when we were studying all those other kind of footnote M's and apartments and things, um, that was because it was of a sort of town-wide sort of um, amendment. It was something that uh, no one else was gonna do except town staff. Um, this amendment is literally asking for that study from potential developers and, and, and from for the RFP. So to ask the town staff to use their energy, time and focus on that next step doesn't make sense, especially when we have a lot of other zoning amendments that need a lot of research and work. Um, so this is sort of a pathway to that next step that um, a lot of people uh, have been emailing asking for. And um, I guess I'll just keep saying, you know, we, we, we aren't, the zoning doesn't design buildings or design for specific, um, I guess it doesn't uh, provide exact answers. It's to, like Nate was saying, it's to provide a guide, it's to provide a sort of pathway for potential um, um, projects. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I keep, I feel like we're having the same conversation every week, but, um, but that's, yeah, that's why we aren't supposed to be thinking through at the, this fine level of detail. I, I really feel like this is, um, this is a guide, it's a stepping stone. It's not the answer. So um, um, yeah, I, 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 I hear all the people asking for that, but um, I just, I think that's the wrong use of resources of our town staff and planners um, and building department to be um, designing a building that this is literally asking the next step to be that, so from someone else. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, Jack? Do you still want to comment? 
Yes, I um, excuse me. I would like to say ditto, ditto, ditto to Maria's uh, comments. My she she covers so much. I I can't even like uh, follow up that. Uh, you know, she hit all the points. So um, yes. So I have no other comments. Okay. So I guess uh, thus far, what I'm hearing is that some members feel we have enough information to vote on this and to recommend it, and that some members do not think we have enough information yet. Uh, are there other comments from the board? Uh, well, I, Janet, I'm going to wait for you. I, I want to hear from Tom and Johanna first. So, Tom? Sure. Uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, no, I, I'll follow up and just say that I, I appreciate seeing it in this format, I think, um, really detailed, Nate, uh, and outlined. Um, I think that the, the notion that we're, we're making, um, that the zoning is coming with standards and conditions is, uh, and that they're relatively detailed in terms of the expectations for the next step, I think is really important. So I think that's a, um, a really helpful way for us to move forward without getting into the weeds of what this is going to look like or um, you know how it's going to exactly operate because I feel like that's what comes next. But, um, but I appreciate the level of detail in this and um, I, I think it's ready for a vote. All right, thank you. And Johanna. Um, yeah, similar to what Tom said, you know, I um, just based on all the work we've done on this, I'm um, definitely leaning towards this being the best site to explore for a parking garage in town as opposed to other places. I really appreciate the overlay and the constraints that are put on it and the kind of guidelines that are going to be put out there in the RFP. I personally am not yet convinced that a parking garage is necessary, but I'm interested in seeing kind of what this, you know, kind of public private partnership, whether the market supports it. So um, I too would be comfortable, you know, moving ahead and voting on it tonight. Okay. And Janet, and after you, Janet, I think I'll go to uh, public comment. Okay, so I have a few things to do so to talk about, so I don't want to have those lost. Um, and so I'd like some time. Um, so I, the other question, I, I had another question. We had um, last meeting, we had talked about traffic impacts on the different streets and um, Andrew had raised that issue. And I had sort of expected that some information would come back on potential impacts on North Pleasant Street, North Prospect, Coles. Amity Street, um, you know, maybe the need for turning lanes and things like that. And so I don't know, I don't think this is excessively detailed questions. I think these are kind of normal questions. I know that town meeting, when I was in town meeting, we often got a massing study. I think the town council will want to see it. Um, these questions will come up in town council. It's kind of what we should be asking about. So has any of that been done? And have any more thought about impacts on the roads or where the best places would be to exit or enter exit? is does the, does the town have access or a, a, a right to use the CVS exit and there are a lot to get out that we're doing right now? Is it just uh, habit? Okay, so Chris, I see your hand. We really think that those are things that are going to be addressed during the design process and that allowing um, something to be considered on this property um, doesn't mean that we have to uh, have all the answers um, in hand and answers about um, traffic impact, et cetera. We probably need to hire a traffic engineer to do that. And if we wanted to talk about turning lanes and um, all of those types of things, that would cost the town a lot of money to figure that out all in advance. And those things will be figured out when there is a proposal. So at this stage of um, just opening the door to allow the possibility of a parking garage to be built here, um, we wouldn't expect to have that information. Thank um, you, Chris. Okay, uh, so you have another question, Janet? Yeah, so we had also talked about setbacks, like side and rear setbacks. Um, in the BG, um, the side setbacks are 10 feet 
of course, with um, nefarious footnote A, and then the backs, rear setbacks are also, um, I have a little problem here. Um, yeah, so the front setbacks is zero to 20, um, and then the, the rear setbacks are, are 10. And so one question I really, and, and I feel really strongly about this because I own a property with a building right on the property line, and I have a part of the garage is on a property line. Have, has anyone told CVS owners that this proposal could be building a building right up to the property line and also taking away the spaces that they're currently using for their customers for free? Has that conversation taken place with St. Bridget's and what was their reaction? Because you know, the, I don't know that they've actually seen this and understand what's happening. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Chris? So I don't know what conversations the uh, proponents of the original um, zoning amendment had with St. Bridget's and CVS. We have sent um, notifications to everybody within 300 feet of this property for the public hearing that's going to be held next week by the uh, CRC. So they will have an opportunity at that time to uh, comment. And, um, and that's, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Have, they, Thank you. have they seen the um the drawings or just the notification? Well, they were certainly aware of these 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 hearings, um, and so if they want to participate in the hearings, they'll see the drawings. Okay. So, uh, another question, Janet. Actually, not a question. I actually I sent out an email with 10 additional requirements that I think should be added to the um, to the, um, the PFAD, the Parking Facilities Overlay District. And so I'd like to make a motion that we add those to it and then discuss them. And, and I, I can give my reasons why, because I was looking for like a way forward and um, trying to reverse the, try, trying to take concerns and considerations in advance and shape this proposal or the zoning amendment so it's stronger, it's more clear, it provides reassurances to, to abutters and um, you know, residents. Um, and so, so my goal was to find the middle ground. I am very concerned that this property, this, this parking lot is too small for a parking garage. You know, the, the, the study that we, the last study that was done about it gave kind of mixed reviews based on a parking garage on the CVS lot plus the town lot and basically said does you know it's it, it picked that as the best of the three spots it looked at the bank center and also the Amity Street lot it said that financially it, it didn't look like a big money maker it suggested going for state grant money and um, that long-term parking would be a better source of income than short-term parking and since the purpose of this lot is to provide destination parking for people coming in and out of Amherst, I think that, um, so, so, so I'm just trying to figure out how to get support from the neighbors, make them feel reassured, and actually to be flexible. Like maybe the Amity Street lot plus Bank of America is a better spot. Developers can look at both of the overlays and pick which one they want to do, competition and things like that. So I'd like to make a motion to add the 10 additional requirements listed in my document for the parking facilities overlay district. I'd love a second so we can just kind of go through them and discuss them. Thank you. Do we, do we have a second? Jack, I'm seeing your hand. Jack seconds, you are muted. <laughs> Jack, you're still muted. I am so I am so out of practice um, being um, you know non-chairman. Sorry, um, <laughs> but I, I would like to hear the the points, and that's why I'm seconding. Okay, thank you, Pam. Do you have that memo from Janet available to show on the screen? Missing mine. Okay. Yeah, can you? Uh, That's the wrong one. Well done. Okay. 
I get all confused trying to find the, the Word documents. Where's the packet? The downloads. It's not in the packet. I sent it in, uh, to attach to an email. I think Nate may have it. No, oh, I have it, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Here it is. Yeah, I was sharing my screen. I don't know if that's from me, Pam, or from you, <laughs> but as if this is oh, visible. It is yours, but I did yeah. find it. Okay, Nate, I guess you get to drive for a while. Sure. So this is um you know this was sent in an email today. So the first uh, Janet, condition do you, is do you want to speak to this or do you want Nate to continue? Um I'm not sure what Nate's talking. I mean, is he I, I'd love to speak to my 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 guidelines, but Nate, did you have something to say too? Oh no, I was just gonna go read through them. I was gonna go number oh. one, but if you want to do that, you you can as well. Yeah. Okay, I, I'd prefer to do it. Um and I'll try to speak slowly. Um, the first addition or condition would be to limit the total height to 40 feet, including the mechanicals and solar panels. Um, this was to alleviate concerns that the building would just get bigger and bigger. And, um, you know, that if solar, we all love solar panels, and it would be a great thing to put over the roof deck parking, but that could push up another eight or 10 feet. And suddenly we're at BG height or 50 feet or more. And so, um, that was just to give reassurance that this building is not going to be big, not to be anti-solar, um, but to, to reduce the mass and size of the building um, to the height of um, the adjoining RG district. Um, the elevator tower, you know, could obviously, obviously needs to go above the roof deck. Um, but, I, and then, you know, the one of the criteria, so that would be um, the ele elevator tower could be taller but it would be opposite the residences. Cause I just, you know, I was just picturing, I've lived in a city and I, you know, I, it's like, if you were living next to a parking garage with a, you know, a, an elevator going up and down all night long, doors opening and closing and people talking, you know, put that over towards North Pleasant street, give, give the people on Prospect street or um, South or North Prospect street, if this was an Amity street arrest. Um, so that was number one. And I just wonder what people thought of that one. If Why don't you go? Through, I think I'd like you to go through them all, and then we'll see okay. whether there's, uh, you know, interest in pursuing any of uh, any in particular. Okay. And by the way, thank you, Jack, for seconding. Um, the second one is to include in the parking overlay district the CVS lot, the town lot on Amity Street, and the adjoining Bank of America and People's Bank parking lots. I might throw in the um, lot owned by Barry Roberts next to the CVS also. Um, and here's, here's the idea is, I just think, you know, if we're gonna build a parking garage, let's just build one and let's make sure it's economically viable. I don't see that this small parking garage, it may not be viable, but we have all these parking lots next to it. Why not just include them into it? Um, and, or just the option to. So this doesn't say, no, you can't build on the town lot. It just tells to any developer you can add to it. And then it also offers the Amity Street lot, the Bank of America lot, and the People's Bank lot. Um, a developer could say, you know, I'd like to use Amity Street. It's really central. It's, you know, whatever. And then they could talk to Bank of America and see if they can cut a deal. Maybe they'll buy the lot, you know, or the People's Bank lot and they'll share it. And so it just gives flexibility about the options. It's kind of the American way. It's not saying no to anything, but it's just giving opening up um, the possibilities. We don't have any kind of analysis of whether this is the best spot or the bad, good spot or not. And so let's let the developers have the flexibility to do that. Um, so that's um, number two. Number three is requiring a solid building facade on any parking garage 
um, that fronts homes on North and South Prospect Street. This would not be in, an incredibly large or expensive um, wall. Um, and I, I think it probably wouldn't have big costs in terms of ventilation because the you know it's not that wide. I think it's like 110 feet on South Prospect Street, maybe a little longer. Um, and I just think again, you know, anybody living in an old Victorian house doesn't want to be hearing people coming out of the Drake at 12 o'clock or one in the morning, you know, doing their alarms to get the cars open, the strange sound that my hybrid vehicle makes when it backs up, lights, people shouting, door slamming. And so that I think just gives protection to the neighborhood that they can sleep at night and have the parking garage be a good neighbor. Okay, Nate, can you scroll down? Thank you. Um, number four is required that the solid exterior facade along North and Pros South Prospect Street and Amity Street reflect the character of the 19th century buildings adjoining and across the street, um, the historic, the local historic district whose name I, uh, the Prospect Gaylord Historic District. And again, this is to make this the parking garage an ad um, to the to the downtown. This is probably everybody's sort of favorite part of town, all the old buildings, and just to make sure it fits in. And there's lots of examples of this, and it doesn't have to be a solid wall on Amity Street. But you know, I just Googled it, and there's lots of people building really attractive parking garages. I opted for a more historic fit because pretty much every building, including the People's Bank, is going in a traditional style there, and it kind of keeps it going. Um, there are some very wild modern examples were sort of interesting, but I thought, I think this would again gain support for people if they felt like what goes in is attractive and fits in. And there is an option also on the Amity Street to put um, small stores along the front, which an example I set around. Um, number five would be um, exiting cars only onto the main arteries of North Pleasant and Amity Street. Again, nobody wants to have lights coming, you know, 35, 40 cars leaving at 11 o'clock at night when a, a show is over or the cinema is out. It just makes sense to me not to inflict that on people. And I don't think it's much of a burden for the garage um, because there's already a way to, to get into it from North Pleasant or from Amity Street. Um, let's see. Uh, number six is require a year round ever, evergreen vegetative screen to cover the building walls. Maybe not the whole amount, but the walls that are facing residences, and that may include deciduous plantings, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, number seven is side and rear setbacks of 10 feet. Um, I just I just think it's no, I really wanna speak strongly against having side setbacks where people can build up to a property line. And I think it puts a burden on the, abut the use of people abutting property owners, like they're very limited in what they can do. If you wanna fix your parking garage, you're standing on their property, if you want to put a building in, you know, you're constructing under a very tight envelope. I live this experience and I can't tell you how negative it is. And I don't think we should inflict it onto some other, some, onto St. Bridget's or, you know, anybody, you know, People's Bank or whoever is, you know, abutting. Um, Nate, can you scroll down? Thank you. Let's see. Um, number eight is required that 50% of the parking spaces are available for short term use until 10 o'clock at night. Um, that just sort of speaks for itself. Um, the purpose of this garage is not long-term parking or can be used for it, but during the day, our goal is Destination Amherst to get people in and out to know there's parking spaces to help the local businesses. And so the fear that people have expressed to me or in this meeting is that it's just going to be long-term parking for you know, our expensive um, apartments that are coming in downtown. This doesn't say no to it, but make sure there's space there. Um, number nine, I would... Um, say we should do this by special permit by the ZBA and not site plan review by the planning board. Um, you know, this is going to be a controversial project and the ZBA can take a fine tooth comb to it and make sure it fits in and looks good. Um, the special permit, it has more criteria and it's more clear and also some more control by the board to kind of move things around. Um, and so I, I would just advocate for that. Um, and we, we have special permits for all sorts of buildings. I think this one, you know, to give everybody reassurances that there's a, a little bit more of a, a harder look, a little more thorough look. Um, and then finally, um, to, to avoid excessive, number 10, to avoid excessive curb cuts, requirement that easements be secured to cross existing car exits and entrances. I think, you know, this one's a little heavy handed, but I just thought we don't want like 
more and more curb cuts on South Prospect Street or North Prospect Street, or, you know, just it's just, let's consolidate them. There's already a, a system of sharing and just make sure it stays. All right, thank you, Janet. So Jack, I see your hand. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, I, I don't want to go, you know, item by item, but I think Janet has, you know, there, there's, a, there's a handful of very good points. And so, you know, I would move that, um, you know, the planning department reviews these, uh, you know, and consider it revising. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, they, they're not certain of the expediency of this particular, you know, bylaw, but, you know, open to conversation, but I, I thought, I think there are some very good points here. Um, so that's it. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Chris or Nate, do you have any comment about this? Some of these? I, I would rather hear what specifics we'd want to change because, you know, my my thought is on some of these these would be great things to have in a request for a proposal and not specific to zoning in terms of curb cuts or the number of parking spaces available for short term users. I also think that some of these things are um, um, parts of the design and process that would work during permitting. So the planning board has plenty of authority to review the design and shape and massing of a structure its placement on the site, the curb cuts, the traffic impact, the design of the facility. So, you know, I think all those things can be done through permitting uh, with the permit, you know, with the planning board, not in this, in, and the ZBA, but I don't, you know, I don't think the planning board has any less ability to do that. Um, you know, and so for, for a number of these, it would really be then what does the planning board think in terms of the direction? So, you know, I think if they, you know, I can, you know, for instance, if number five or whatever number the planning board would like, I, I'd like to hear the direction uh, specifically because I feel like there's a lot here to, to consider if it's just left to staff. Um, okay. so. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom. Sure. Thanks, um, Doug. I, I, you know, Janet, I really appreciate all this, these comments. I, and I, I tend in many cases on this list to agree with Nate in that I feel like a lot of them will belong in an RFP, especially about, you know, the use of parking, because I do think what we need to address there is your concern about having an actual review of our parking needs. And so to say 50% without actually having any kind of analysis doesn't really make sense. So I think including that in RFP or including that they provide an RFP, uh, a review of our parking requirements downtown and then having us, you know, uh, give input or feedback about setting those values, I think is a really important thing. I mean, I think, you know, trying to cut down on sound in a parking lot is difficult because there's a parking lot there and people are going to flood out of whatever's there, get in their car, slam the door, honk and chit chat and all that stuff anyway. So I feel like, you know, we're, you know, again, that's, it's a nice, nice thought but there's already a parking garage there so if we don't build it it's still it's still a problem um, for those particular people i think the one thing i will say is that for item number two um, about the multiple lots i feel like the only problem i have with that right now is that we haven't reviewed those um, whereas we reviewed this one in great detail and so i would recommend that if we want to add an overlay district to these other lots um, and somebody brings it to us that we can review that, have a conversation about it, and then approve that. Um, no one's stopping anybody from doing that. Um, it's just that it's been requested that we look at one particular lot, then that, you know, whoever's going to propose the, um, the parking garage there will have to determine whether it's feasible there or not. And if it's not, then maybe we do want to consider other locations and maybe someone should bring forward um or propose that we do look at an option for um additional parking lots in the area or parking areas um to be approved for an overlay but again i don't think it's part of the purview of right now because we haven't reviewed those things so i don't feel comfortable adding those in without having that conversation um, as a group and actually looking at those sites in particular yeah i mean this this proposal originated with two town councilors who convinced town councilor to refer it to us for these hearings. And uh, 
you know, that's all we've really been asked to do at the moment. Maria? Okay. Um, yeah, those, those are really great points. And Janet, a lot of your concerns are exactly the things we need to be thinking about at the next step. Um, but um, just to be specific about answering what Nate wanted to know, if there are any particular edits, um, you, uh, like, for example, I don't agree with number one or number seven, the sort of changing of the dimensional regulations that um, Nate had already presented. I think those would just stay as drawn up in my opinion um, that's wh where where I am standing and then um, most of the other points are exactly the kinds of things that um, will come up when we have a design um, and those are all really great concerns um, oh also don't don't agree with number nine about changing from SP to SPR um, but otherwise uh, yeah it, it's all the kind of deep dive into the sort of questions and um, uh, research and data that we need to make sure this parking deck works in all of the different ways we've always already brought up as far as financial traffic, parking, scale, massing, all that. So um but uh yeah I I, Nate, I don't I, I I would say um kind of I forget who said kind of uh, uh, like what um Jack was saying just sort of you know review with the staff and just keep a lot of these suggestions and ideas in mind for the RFP stage but that I, I wouldn't change anything right now in the bylaw. Uh, amendment that you proposed. Thank you. Uh, Jack, you are next. Yeah, I just want to, I, I guess I, I was seeking some conversation <laughs> uh, amongst the board. Um, and I, I really thought Tom and, and uh, Maria, you know, helped me understand, you know, where we're at with this. And, um, you know, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not really uh, you know, concern, you know, the setbacks and, you know, the, the dimensional things are, are, they should be a, in line, you know, with, you know, as proposed and, but I really would like to see this area kind of expanded. Um, but again, that's another process as, as Doug, you know, you know, mentioned. So, uh, but yeah, no, I appreciate the comments of uh, Maria and Tom. Thank you, Jack. Johanna. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the potential implications of the first recommendation to include the mechanicals in the 40 feet height. Um, and maybe this is a question for Nate, but like based on what we know now and <coughs> other parking garages, perhaps the Greenfield one, how many parking levels would we have in a 40 foot structure? And if we included mechanicals, would it eliminate one of the levels potentially yeah sure i think the um you know the 40 feet as measured from the street you know the uh, because of the topography of this site you know there could be a subterranean level so you know a developer could go if the developer wants to wants to go you know spend their time going uh, underground you know so 40 feet you could say it could be a five-story garage with two stories buried um so 40 feet from the street might you know, might be a three story with a surface parking on the, you know, on the upper deck, you know, to get uh, solar panels um, that are, say, if they're, you know, stadium mounted above cars and above, um, you know, and then with an angle, I mean, that might add another, you know, it could be 12 feet, right? So really, essentially, you're, you're getting down to a, you know, in the 20 foot um, height for the upper parking deck. Um, you know, I feel like, would, you know, that's just, you know, an estimate in terms of if we're, you know, if we're measuring it, um, you know, typically uh, the way the zoning bylaw works, we don't include, you know, solar panels as part of the height and on any building, right? We don't include some of these mechanicals in the height calculation anyways. And so I think for, you know, staff relied on that and, you know, um, and just trying to come up with a, what's a, what would be a continuous uh, elevation. So, you know, to the, height of a, of a parapet wall or screening, that's usually a level, you know, it's level across the garage, right? At least at some point it's, it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's a determined height as opposed to trying to say like a three-story level, um, that's a harder thing to measure because the garage floor moves, right? There's a slope to it. Um, 
but I think 40 feet, including solar, would greatly reduce the upper height of the upper deck, Dep you know, depending on how the solar is arranged. So it's reasonable to think that might cost a, uh, a level of parking. Right. OK, one level. Um, I see Janet's hand. Maybe you can make one more comment, and then we'll turn to public comment. Nate, I have a clarifying question. So if, if it's 40 feet at the parapet, and then there's solar panels overhead. Is that 12 feet from the the roof deck up? So it's like, and so that would just add more shadow and on the right. But so are you saying like 12 feet from the the roof deck surface? So Janet, Janet, one way to think of it would be the first level would be zero to 12 feet. The second level would be 12 to 24. The, the third level would be 24 to 36. And you could potentially have a fourth level of parking on the roof. Yeah. At that 36 feet above the above the sidewalk, which uh, you know couldn't have much of anything on top of it, if the 40 feet you know gets you to the top of the parapet wall of the top level of parking. So then I'm just I guess the question is. Under your scenario, you're 36 feet at the roof deck, and then you add 12 feet if you had like a roof of solar yeah, panels. Yeah, so the okay. 12 feet would be measured from the 36 feet height. Okay, right. thank you. So the total would be something like 48. But, you know, all of these numbers are purely speculative right now. Well, they're that's helpful. the way the solar panels are measured now if they go on a, on a house, right? If they're stadium mount, they're not part of the height calculation. So you could have a roof. 40 feet in the RG district to the midpoint. So the peak could be higher. And then if you have stadium mount or something above the roof, you're adding, you know, height to the roof of the of a residential structure as well. All right. So why don't we let's see. I'm I see we're we've passed eight o'clock. Usually we take a break around eight o'clock. Do do people want to take a break or should we go ahead with public comment on this topic and then break? I'm inclined to go ahead with public comment. I'm seeing Johanna agreeing with that, Jack agreeing with that. Okay, so why don't we go ahead to public comment? And uh, first, first person I see is Harry Peltz. If you could state your name and your address, and you are, you have three minutes for con for comment. Uh, Mr. Peltz, are you there? Hi, Harry. Please unmute yourself. Okay. No, I'm sorry. All uh, right. We can now hear thank you. you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I reside at 32 North Prospect Street, which is directly across from uh, the entrance to that property is directly across from the exit from CBS's lot. Uh, my fellow residents are going to be commenting as well. We have a condominium group that houses approximately uh, 18, 20 people as their residences. I have some specific concerns. One, this 40 foot height, this lot slopes down towards CBS. I want to know specifically where this 40 foot height restriction uh, applies. Secondly, I'm concerned that there wasn't more planning, even though you can say, oh, it may cost the town some money to do that and more investigation. You have a 2019 uh, uh, report that has not been updated. I'm also concerned about the fact that this is proposal is being pushed by two of the town council people who have to stand for election uh, this coming November. And they seem to indicate that there has been some proposal and contract negotiations with, uh, with a proposed bill. There's been very little public 
access to the process that's gone on. And I believe it, it, it impairs the credibility and trust in our town government when so little is given about the actual process that is happening. And it also indicates to me from past experience that possibly there are some agreements between some people that would result in a profit to business people or others in town government as a result of this particular proposal. I'm going to defer to my other uh, fellow residents who have, I know, extended comments. And I ask you the question of traffic and the effect on the historic residential area on the other side of North Prospect Street is going to be an impact which I think will diminish our town greatly. And I ask you to consider that along with everyone else's comments. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, next we have Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam. Hi there, Pam Rooney. What's your name and your address? 42 Cottage Street, Pam Rooney. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. Uh, one quick question that Nate can answer afterwards, and that is what is the difference between a frontage zone and a front setback? If he could explain that, that would be great. Um, in the, in the 3.231 section, the applicability, um, I would agree that it is not just the this, this CVS area lot, but also uh, that should be broadened to include the Amity Street lots, and those would be parcel 14A 216, 14A 330, 14A 217. I have to disagree with a number of you who um, stated that 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 kind of conversation is outside of your purview. I think very much that the planning board has the responsibility to take something that's handed to you and actually analyze it to understand if there are broader applications for it or if it's just an absolute single, uh, single application. So I do appreciate that at least somebody is asking to take that broader look. Um, um, let's see. The conversation about the height, um, I think you're going to hear a lot of this. Uh, it's, it's interesting because on the one hand, um, a 40 foot height in the, in the RG, I think is typically measured to, um, it would be to the top of the parapet. But I think it's absolutely a valid question to ask for a massing diagram because a 40 foot uh, structure on North, Pleasant, uh, North Prospect Street is a very, very different beast than it would be if it were out in the middle of a parking lot somewhere with, without a you know, two story or two and a half story um, gabled mid 1800s neighborhood next to it. So I think the request for a, a massing is absolutely appropriate in that setting and um, would strongly recommend that you all suggest doing that before it goes to town council. So quick, quick summary, I think the application of this should be broader and not limited to this one lot. I know that was what was handed to you on your lap, but I think you all um, are the board to deal with this. And um, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next we have, I believe it's Bob Pam. Uh, please state your name and your address. Hello, Bob Pam. Hello. Hi, I'm Bob Pam, 229 Amity Street. I am speaking as an individual, not as a, an official of any organization. Um, there are three uh, concerns that I guess I would have to uh, address. First one having to do with the library. Uh, as you know, that is next door. Uh, if that project proceeds, the only access that will be available for doing the construction will be 
through the town parking lot. And so that is probably means that for the next three years at least, um, one ought not to be thinking about building anything there. That suggests that there is really no time uh, frame on this, which would require action by this board now. Uh, second, again, thinking about the library, we have um, provided instructions to the architects who've done the work so far that the height of the building ought not to be visible from Amity Street. And I don't know whether um, if you think about this building now, uh, whether that is going to be visible. And if so, should we be reconsidering the height restriction we've put on the library? Second concern has to do with CVS. And I will think of, talk about that in two ways. First is that it is um, the only quasi grocery store in downtown. Um, it depends to a large degree on its parking lot. The parking lot is a free parking lot. If you put it next to a fee parking lot, what I anticipate will happen is that people will park in the CVS lot at eight in the morning and will leave at five or some such hours and its access to its own parking lot will be restricted in ways that are simply not appropriate. Um, the third has to do with neighborhood. And of course, if you talk about this as parking for the Drake, which is a bar as well as other things, um, we're not talking about people leaving at nine. We're not talking about people leaving at 11. We're probably talking about people leaving at one. And when they leave, they will not necessarily be quiet and orderly. So um, think about what that means in terms of the neighborhood. The last point has to do with access. And currently the only way you get into that area is by crossing traffic in most cases uh, on North Pleasant Street. If you then close that for vehicular access and you now put it all onto North Prospect, it is not clear to me um, how that is going to work for that street and for the neighbors to it on Halleck and other streets nearby. So that is, those are the concerns that I would raise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And thank you for the clear articulation of your points. Uh, it certainly sounded like you may have written those out in advance. That was great. Next, we have uh, Ronnie Parker. Would you please state your name and your address? Hi, this is Ronnie Parker again, uh, 24 North Prospect Street. Oh my goodness. I am sure that none of you lives anywhere near here because the idea of a 40 foot building across the street from us, our bedroom is going to be looking into the parking lot. Um, so I really want you to reconsider the height uh, restrictions. Now, many of you have spoken about this in very technical terms. You have to really think about it in human terms. We're going to have a library building that will take down three oaks in the back. The very little green that's here will be taken away. So much for a green Amherst. Um, it's really shocking to me the way this discussion is going on. Um, the proposal did originate with two town councilors, but they're not here for the discussion. They have never explained why they said three levels and now they're saying five. They're, they've literally lied to us when they said, trust us. I heard that myself and I thought, well, of course, you know, these are people who are representing us. So I would charge you to really think about what it's like to be in the place of those of us, because that's your job. You're the planning board for the town of Amherst. You're not talking about your own home. Think about what it's like. Come and walk around here and see what it's like. Somebody said, oh, you know, there's already a parking lot there and there's noise and there are people banging their cars at night. So this is just more of the same. No, it is not. That parking lot is hardly used. It is never full. We never hear noise from there. So hang out here, see what it's like, see what our reality is like before you make these decisions. 
The second thing that I really have noticed here that's bothersome to me is that the town officials um, are supposed to respond to us and to you. They're supposed to provide information. So personally, I don't think it matters that um, Mr. Malloy, I have nothing against you and I want your technical expertise here, but I don't think it matters that you agree or disagree because you're not the designated authority, you're the technical expert. It does matter what the members of the planning board think. And I am sort of surprised from my previous experience with local government that there's so much of a blend here. So since my time is running out again, I would say, please pay attention to height. Think about a tower in front of your bedroom. Do you want that? That's what you're relegating us to. And pay attention to the setbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Next uh, hand I see is from Dorothy Pam. Name and address, please. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, and I'm speaking in my private capacity. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't care for the logic that says the town doesn't want to spend its own money on a traffic study and you want a private person to do so that puts the private person in the driver's seat. I cannot believe that if a traffic study were done, honestly, that this lot would pass. The street, North Prospect Street, is too small, too narrow, and it would not work. Um, I've also seen somebody's um, study that saw, discussed all the on-street parking spots that would have to disappear in order to make North Pos Prospect Street safe as an entrance and exit street for the parking garage so that you are actually cutting into parking that we already have. So um, right now you're saying the town does not want to spend the money on a traffic study, um, yet nobody seems to care that the owners of the property across the street from it will be losing the enjoyment of their homes. They will absolutely have their quality of life changed and made much more negative. Um, there was a moment today when um, the height was discussed as being a normal BG height, but I remember that this lot is now zoned at RG. It's zoned RG. It's right next to a historic block. It took years and years and years for that block to develop, for those houses to be built. And unless you feel like you want to just, you know, erase Amherst history and get rid of the beauty that is here in order to make a convenience for some people who are sure that this parking spot will really work, even though as has been testified again and again, that the part lot is not used very well and that you want the town to forego, if the town is short on money, it will forego the 50,000 or 30 to $50,000 it gets right now a year on parking revenue. So um, I, I am really, really upset that this has continued to be discussed in this way, kind of like, well, we don't know, we can't tell, we'll just let some private money person come in and do the studies to see if this is really a suitable spot. So I totally support Janet's position of, of uh, investigating the Amity Street parking lot, which is in fact in the center of the town, in the center of all of the places that need parking right now. Um, we're talking, of course, about parking for shopping and for entertainment. We're not talking about the us um, devoting our time and energy to provide parking for private developers who chose not to provide parking in their apartments because that would be a total disgrace. So I, I just feel that this is, this is being pushed, it's being rushed, and I, I don't see the point of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Chris, I see your hand. Is there something you want to respond to at this time or shall we wait until the public finishes? I wanted to respond to the comment about um, not wanting to do a traffic study. A traffic study is necessary eventually, but right now nobody has um, appropriated money for a traffic study. So there is no money for a traffic study. Um, town council could um, make that choice to do a traffic study if it thinks that that's necessary and town council has the ability to appropriate money, but the planning department and the planning board don't have that ability. So if people think that that's a necessary component to make this decision, then um, 
so be it. But it's it's not something that I can say yay or nay to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Pam, could you, yeah, thanks, reset the clock. Okay, next uh, hand I see is from Jennifer Taub. Name and address. Hi, Jennifer. Okay, thank you. I didn't have an unmute button. Um, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. Um, I haven't written my comments in advance as pa Bob Pam did because I'm responding to a couple of comments that were made during the planning board's discussion. Um, if I heard correctly, did at least one planning board member said uh, a, voiced a specific objection to having a special permit, uh, but to keep the site plan review? And I think what the residents in the surrounding neighborhood are really feeling is that the planning board just doesn't care what are, how we are affected by this. Would it really be too much to give us you know, the extra care of a special permit instead of a site plan review. So I, I would ask that. Um, it, when, I think the way we got to this overlay district, instead of rezoning, um, one of the concerns, you know, where we were promised that the parking structure, we were promised this by the sponsors of the zoning bylaw amendment would not exceed three stories. And that when I first, you know, the uh, when the proposal was made, instead of rezoning from RG to BG, but to have the overlay, it did seem like a response to our concerns about not permanently changing the zoning until we knew whether a parking structure could actually go there. But it's almost, but the overlay now has parameters where the building could be higher than it was when it was first presented by the sponsors of the amendment for rezoning. So I also share the concern. I don't know how we got from three stories to I have 48 feet. And it, in terms of, I guess, also as an aside with the library, the new wing of the library is gonna have large windows looking north. And is it going to face, you know, a four, what seems like it could almost be the height of a five story building. Um, and then I did wanna reiterate um, in response to uh, the comment that it's already noisy there virtually no one parks in the lot now so it's it's not noisy especially in the evening it's empty thank you thanks very much jennifer um, the next uh commenter is kitty axelson barry please state your name and your address uh kitty uh, am i on yes kitty yes. Wilson Berry at 89 Stony Hill Road, that's in um, Echo Hill South. Um, I agree with Johanna Newman's statement that she's not really sure that a parking facility is needed. And I, I, Johanna, I think you said you would be willing to, you know, go along with it, um, but that really there's a lack of information about whether it's actually needed. Um, there were two studies recently done of parking. One was just in 19, 2019, two years ago. And that recent study concluded that a parking facility should be the last resort here. And I have to say, a parking facility might be the right thing and it might be the right thing there. But it's the, this advice from the consultants that the town hired has been completely ignored. They had a number of um, other solutions to the perceived problem of parking. One of them was signage, one was lighting, one was using existing spots that are not used currently during the busiest hours for visitors, which was certain evenings. One is that we have, that they suggest that we use two feet less space for existing street parking spots. And another word, one ironically was that we required developers to provide one to three spaces per dwelling unit. Um, so I don't think that there's been any further documentation at all about whether it's necessary or even wise to have um, such a parking facility. So that's, that's really what my question is, is it needed? And if it is needed, could, um, could, this, could a new study perhaps um, determine where it is needed? or whether two smaller parking facilities would be better. I mean, we're just running blind here on the basis of these two counselors and the bid director, I think. Um, so that's 
That's it. I'd be curious about what a, a study would say about, is it needed? And if so, where? Thank That's you, it. Katie. Uh, Jay Silverstein, please give your name and your address. Hi, Jay. Hi, how is everyone? Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> Jay Silverstein, 32 North Prospect Street, Unit 4, I'm in one of the condos directly across the street of where the proposed garage will be. Uh, first, I'd like to start by saying to Mr. Malloy, I really appreciate the mumbo jumbo, but you didn't answer any of the questions for the residents. You just played a hot shot. Uh, also, one of the things I'd like you to correct is you said that you're gonna go up 12 feet with the greenery. Uh, the building, however, is gonna be up to 48 feet. So that means 30 feet of, of garage you're gonna let us look at. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Long, uh, I don't really particularly like the way you snickered when you say noise is noise from the garage. We don't have any because half the, the garage is never more than half full as the parking on the street. Now, let me just give you some numbers. There are 36 spaces now on North Prospect Street. There are 21 spaces on Halleck, uh, and there's 75 in the, in the lot that's there. That's 132 spaces. Ross and Ryan said, in not three stories, but three levels, they said one could be lower and two could be above ground at 65 spots, uh, 65 spaces per level. That's 195. So 195 minus 132, you could do the math, it's 63 spaces. However, Cowles Lane will probably also lose spaces. Uh, there are 13 spaces because it's a very narrow street and in the winter, it's very unnavigable. So now we're down to 50 spaces. Then of course, in, 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 in the wisdom of the, uh, of the CRC, they took away the main street parking of another 31 spots. So now we have a net gain of parking uh, of uh, uh, less than 50 spots. So it really, uh, I, I don't know if it pays. Uh, Ms. Chow, uh, you're really putting the cart before the horse. I, I mean, if the resident came to you and said they wanted to change their zoning, what would you do? Would you say, okay, change your zoning and then we'll see what you're gonna build? You wouldn't do that. And I don't know why you're doing it to the residents of uh, North Prospect Street and the surrounding area. These are, are you gonna have the facade, facade look like uh, a Victorian, grand Victorian homes? No, no, no builder will do that. And first of all, chances of it, with the speed that you want to be at, that you're acting in and the lack of facts that are, are, are pertaining to this, I mean, the, the residents of North Prospect Street, as well as the other residents, we really suspect impropriety. I mean, how else can we think? You're not responding to the people. You're doing what you want to do. And to be honest with you, I'm looking at you all night and you really have a, you know, you, well, let's get rid of this. This is the attitude I'm picking up. Let's just vote on this and get rid of it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silverstein. The next uh, commenter will be Susanna Musbrad. Name and address. Hi, Hi Susanna. Hello, uh, Susanna Musbrad, 38 North Prospect Street. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak. Um, I think you have my comments at some length in your packet, and I feel like I've said so many times what's objectionable about this garage. Uh, I would like some clarification, if somebody can give it, about who is going to be writing this RFP and whether there will be any opportunity for public input in the process of creating the RFP, or is that just going to be done so out of the public eye. Um, I don't understand, uh, particularly Ms. Chow, why you're saying that it's worth spending effort on looking at um, 
sites that are all over town that are affected by some zoning amendments and it's not worth putting any effort into this particular overlay because this overlay is really to describe one building and that is one parking garage. I don't understand why suddenly for the height you go with the um, RG height limit when you won't go with the RG side setbacks or front setbacks. I mean, a building that's right up to the street, practically in front and 40 feet high is going to have an entirely different presence than one of the houses on the other side of the street that's two and a half stories with a peaked roof with at least 10 foot side setbacks. Many of them have more and at least 20 feet in front. Um, we need to see how that build out is going to look in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood context. It's hard for people who are not architects to um, put, be able to imagine that in their head. And it would really help us if we could see it. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, that's the last public comment I see, at least at this time. I see Jack, uh, you've got your hand up. You want to make a comment? Yeah, I just I, I want to you know reiterate uh, that yeah we we there's a perception for Amherst downtown that there's you know lack of parking that there's this I've I've heard that you know from ninety percent of the people that I, I've spoken with so so we do have this perception and so. Um, you know, a lot of folks, you know, are talking about, you know, finessing, you know, what, you know, what's, you know, available or not. But I think there's this perception that we, and that's why this is appealing, I think. And, but I agree that it needs, you know, it probably needs a little bit more of a look in terms of, um, you know, finessing and, and expanding, <laughs> um, you know, but, I do feel like we have to be careful that the design, you know, this is zoning. This is not a, a design study. No one, no one has proposed anything, and so um, I just feel like we're like putting the, you know, people are jumping to conclusions on on this. Uh, but this is a much needed uh, initiative. I think that the town needs to to push through. Okay. Thank you, Jack. I see uh, Janet, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you for um, the comments from people in the public. Um, I always appreciate hearing from people. Um, and I take it very seriously. Um, I have a question is how much time would it take to do a massing study of the maximum build out of the parking garage with the surrounding buildings? And then, you know, I would request like make the facade on North Prospect Street look pretty, like it fits into a you know a 19th century neighborhood, and then make it look like a parking garage. And so people might have very different reactions to the facade. Um, and we can do design review standards. We can put them inside the zoning. We you know, I wouldn't rely on the design review board standards. I've never seen the planning board apply them. The design review board feels unheard. Um, and things like that. So I just think it, I think it would help us to understand what we're approving. It would help the CRC. It will help the neighborhood. It might make them feel better because the, you know, the setback is fairly large, the frontage space. Um, it might make them feel better to see a facade that fits in. It may, you know, it might be, you know, a factory building with some fancy work on it, an interesting brickwork. Um, you know, and I, I just think, you know, I don't know why we're pushing forward and sort of surging on, like, why not just do a little extra work, listen to concerns, let's build, let's put something together that people support and don't feel opposed to. There's no rush for this. I mean, you know, Gabrielle Gould said that this wouldn't even be, you know, starting till 2024 or 2025. And I, and I just, I think, you know, let's take some time with it. But my question started with time, like how long would it take for to do a massing study and um, have the CRC and us take a look at it? And the, and the neighbors and the town council. Is that eight hours? Is it four hours? It's sort of outside my, my wheelhouse. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Chris or Nate, would you, either of you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure, Jana, exactly how long. I think it would take, you know, staff, of, you know, a number of hours. Um, I think my concern there is that, um, you know, we could come up with a number of designs for what a parking garage may look like, but that's not actually what a what an applicant may propose. And so, you know, are we writing design standards based on, um, you know, one one concept or many concepts? So I, you know, I think. Um, you know, it is possible. I think it does take a little bit of time because, you know, we don't have the other building, say, in a 3D model. So if we're going to be doing detail on the garage or a concept model and the other buildings are just big masses or blocks, you know, I think people get tripped up in those details. And so um, I think a computer model is helpful for general massing, but to try to get detail and other things in it is um, like we tried with the BL overlay. You know, Janet, you commented and said, well, it looks like we still could build ugly. And some of it is because computer renderings take a lot of time to make it look nice. Um, and so a massing model or a concept study is a lot different than a detailed design model. And so I think a concept model is something that, you know, staff could do in a few days. Um, you know, that's two staff working, you know, at many hours a day. So we could, you know, do the math. Um, you know, that's like, you know, um, it's like six work days of time. Um, and, but that's not providing detail or things that would be necessary that you're asking for. So that's not, you know, showing facade details or treatments because that's really difficult to articulate. So, cause I've seen like thank, when- Thank it, you, thank you, Nate. Um, Chris, do you want to comment on that at all? Well, I, I would like to comment because, you know, we have a lot of other things that we're working on and to take, um, you know, six days of time to do a massing model for a garage that may look completely different from what we imagine in our massing model doesn't seem like a good use of staff time. We have many urgent pressing things that we're trying to accomplish. So I don't necessarily think that you need that in order to make a decision, but um, I'm not making the decision. So that's right. up to you. Okay, thank you. So at this point, I think what I'd like to do is to ask uh, people to indicate whether they are comfortable making a decision one way or the other tonight. So the first, uh, the first roll call I'd like to do is um, whether you're comfortable doing any sort of decision making tonight. All right. And, and um, so, uh, Maria, what do you, are you comfortable making a decision one way or the other tonight? Yes. Okay. Uh, Tom, what about you? I am comfortable with that. Yes. And recognizing that we're making a, decision about zoning and not approving a parking garage building to be built, yes. Okay. Um, Janet? So I am not comfortable, like I listed this before the meeting that we have no massing study. We don't know the number of parking spaces in a garage, the need for the parking, the economic feasibility, no comparison with other sites. We don't know what's gonna be removed on North Prospect Street and Coles. We haven't just possible traffic impacts. We have no, uh, you know, very little understanding of the impacts on the neighbors and on the CVS and St. Bridges use of their property with no setbacks. So I count like 11 things that we don't know. We probably don't need to know 11, but we need to know a bunch of them. So, so I would say no. So you are not comfortable? No, I guess not at all. Okay. I, thank you. Um, Johanna? I'd be comfortable moving ahead with this first step. Okay, and Jack? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely on the fence, uh, but you know, with a slim margin, uh, I will, you know. So this is simply, do we, do we wanna have a, a vote to recommend or not tonight? Yeah, so, I mean, so I, again, I, I have to defer to what, you know, Maria and Tom's input really kind of, um, you know, soothe you know some of my concerns, uh, but okay. it, it's a right. difficult. You're on, the, you're on the fence. Yes, I'm. Yeah, it's a complex, you know, piece for the for the downtown. You know, there's no right. doubt, and not without controversy. Right. Um, I do see two more uh, hands in the public. Um, let's see, uh, 
Mr. Peltz, I see you have your hand up. Is that a legacy hand or are you, would you like to make one more comment? Uh, just give me a few more seconds. I was out Friday night with my wife to Greenfield to see that parking garage that was mentioned two times before that was already there. That would be a masking thing. Run up there and take a look at what it looks like. And also notice that it is nowhere near any residences. It's in a large building area and a parking lot, large parking, open parking lot that's opposite to it. Right. Take a trip and take a look. You'll have your masking and you'll see the monstrosity they want to build. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peltz. And uh, Ms. Parker. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. So, um, yeah, I was making the same point that a neighbor of mine did go and see the actual site. And it's nothing like our context. Therefore, I think an important issue is do the, do the people who you represent, whose interests you're supposed to represent, do we need to see this? And we do, because I have to say, honestly, I'm usually the proponent of local economic development. I would. Uh, Ms. Parker, yeah, okay. you, you right. muted Sorry, yourself. I find it, I feel really strange being in a situation that's contrary to my usual, which is pushing economic development. I feel strange being in this place. The truth is, neighbor of, I heard from a neighbor who actually went and saw this garage that you all showed and told me the same thing that Mr. Peltz just did. So we need to see what this is going to look like. That does not apply to our context. That, that is not a good example of what we're dealing with. Therefore, we need to see what it looks like. And the reality is, yes, there's a cost, but look, all of this stuff has a cost and we have to think about it. If we're not willing to do this cost, then what's the goal? I mean, if the goal is really important to us, we should be willing to invest in making it happen. So I'm not, you know, I, have to say, I feel strange. I'm a proponent of economic development. I'm not the person who comes out and says, don't do it. But in this case, we just don't have the information. And for me, it would be very helpful to see what exactly will this look and feel like. So I also suggest that it's a good investment. And in fact, the town should be prepared to make more investments if you're considering any development option because it costs to ensure that the public interest is well represented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So since there seemed to be at least uh, a reasonable level of support for making some sort of decision this evening, uh, does anybody wanna make a motion to recommend this to town council? I think if that would be the preferred form of the motion, so that a yes vote means we recommend and a no vote means we do not recommend. Uh, Tom, I think you got your hand up first. Do I move to um, vote to recommend? Thank you. And Maria, your hand was second? Second. Second. Okay. Do we have any further conversation by the board this evening about this? Okay, uh, Janet. Um, did, um, what was your feeling about is the time to go forward, Doug? Okay, so I guess my feeling is that this is an incremental step. It is not a, uh, a definitive step that, that will result in a garage. Um, you know, uh, I think Maria, was right in that she pointed out that when we are making decisions about multiple parcels with multiple owners, there's no one private entity that would be motivated to study an entire district that is beyond the uh, extent of their property holdings. However, in this case, because this is a single parcel, uh, 
any anybody that wants to put forward a proposal for this will have control of the entire area and therefore they will be incent they will have the motivation to do the study that needs to happen uh, they will have to study the traffic impacts because we um, we will require them to do that uh, they will have to study the financial feasibility of it and whether this parcel is large enough for a parking garage, uh, because they'll want to probably not lose a lot of money on it. And so, uh, you know, at this point, we're recommending to town council, and town council may not adopt it. Um, town council may adopt it, in which case they probably will recommend that town staff prepare this RFP. Uh, I. I presume there would be public input into that um, and the town council would probably want there to be simply to make sure that constituents continue to feel heard. Um, there may be nobody that responds to the RFP because their, their back of the envelope assessment before they do a real proposal is that it's not feasible. Um, so oh. there's a number of ways in which I view this as an incremental step. And I, given that this has been a point of conversation for decades in this town and that we took this property by eminent domain in the 70s, I think, um, it doesn't seem to be a bad idea to finally move it farther, far enough forward to, to actually get some answers on whether it makes sense. So. Uh, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, uh, good, very good comments, Doug. I, did, I feel like the building block sense of this is very important. It's not the end all. It, there's nothing complete. There's nothing, you know, uh, there's no design that, that, that we're approving here, but it's, there's a concept to alleviate the, you know, the perception that, that there is a parking issue downtown, which again, uh, for me is, is, uh, is, is very apparent. So I appreciate that, Doug. I, I appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Janet. Um, I think it'd be really useful if the planning board was involved with the RFP, um, creation, because, um, you know, we've heard a lot from the public about what they're concerned about. And, um, you know, we do have a responsibility and I think it'd be, it'd be, Good for us to be part of that to kind of reflect the concerns and issues that were raised. So okay. I wonder about your thoughts on that too. Well, I, I have to confess I don't know enough about how the town, what the town process is for developing our fees to know whether it would make sense for us. Uh, you know, I think there'll be a number of groups that want to be uh, at least have their voices heard. Chris, Chris, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we do from time to time have groups or at least individuals from groups that are participate in the RFP process. Um, we had participation from the chair of the housing trust in the um, development of the RFP for the Belchertown Road and East Street uh, project that would provide affordable housing. So I think that we could um, conceivably get the planning board involved in the development of the RFP or at least reviewing um, what we develop. Okay, great. All right, uh, we have a motion uh, on the floor and a second. Um, I don't see any more hands, so why don't we go ahead through the uh, the roll call? All right, uh, in the order of my squares on my screen, uh, Maria. Ruth. Tom, this is to recommend to the town council. Approved to recommend to council. All right, Janet. Disapprove. Thank you. Johanna. Aye. Uh, Jack. Aye. And I am an aye. So we have five in favor, one opposed and one absent. All right, at this time, it's just before nine. I'll we'll take a five minute break, uh, um, check on the Red Sox and- um, May I suggest that at... you 
close the public hearing if that's your intention. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Chris, for keeping me honest here. Um, so I'm public closing the public hearing at 8.57. And we'll take a five minute break, come back at two minutes after nine. Please uh, turn off your video and mute yourself uh, until you're back. Thank you.
Well, I guess I'm sorry. I went and checked on the Red Sox. I, I don't follow any of that. And I'm so thankful that I don't. <laughs> and, and that no one in my house does. <laughs> I'm, I'm purely a fair weather fan. Oh, yeah. So when they are when they get into the postseason, I pay a little bit of attention. I work somewhere where they would get visibly and physically just upset. Like they couldn't <laughs> function when the Red Sox weren't doing well. And yeah. so emotional about it. It was pretty funny to see. <laughs> well. Like, I don't think I got that emotional about my kids, even, you know, like they were just <laughs> so into it. That was bad. I guess so. I did, had no idea it was going that bad. That, yeah. Well, I was watching last night at the end and there was that one strike that, that was called a ball and that yeah. would have been really consequential. Yeah. I hope well, the umpire thinks about that for the rest of his life. No. <laughs> I don't think so. I doubt it. No. Well, they're keeping it interesting. Oh, yeah. So yeah. the advertisers will be happy. So Doug, not that it matters, I guess, at this point, but we never voted on my motion. I just realized this. So. Ah, well, let's talk to our parliamentarian here. Chris, Chris? I, put, I put it on you. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, uh, you know, incompetent. Um, yes, I think you should vote on it because it was a motion that was made and seconded. Yeah, I should, have remembered. I should have remembered myself. So yeah, I'm sorry about that, Janet. It's okay. So we've got, let's see, we've got everyone with the Ohana back. Do I do I look as washed out on the screen as I think I do? You do look you do you look do. really you're not yeah. ghost like. You're I got to work. I got to figure out the lighting in this shop that I'm squatting in. You also the background is like kind of like really light strange. Yeah, I've got the blur function on for the rear for the background. Where, where are you? Are you in I'm a garage? In, I'm in my I'm in my workshop in the basement. Oh. I always feel a little bit of a common, you know, experience with Andrew when he's on, and I can tell that he's in his garage. Yes, yes, with the with the like the the opener. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> the garage door opener is overhead. All right, we got we got Johanna back, so we're all back together. Um, for those of you that came in late, uh, we we had a, a mistake in terms of our procedure, and we never voted on Janet's motion for the changes to the uh, the bylaw. So I think we need to go through a roll call for that. Um, I guess I need to ask is, was there any more conversation about that that people wanted to have? All right, so I don't see any hands for that. So uh, I'll just go through the roll call here. Maria? No. Uh, Janet? Um, yes. Uh, Jack. You are muted, Jack. Jeez, so bad at that. Um, so I would say um, nay, but I, I think the town council will know and, and the CRC will know, you know, our concerns. Okay, I, I hope. So. thank you. Tom? Nay. And Johanna. Nay. And I'm a nay. Okay, so uh, I think that cleans up the procedure for that. Um, so the time now is 9.07.
And the next item is under old business, the zoning bylaw, article three, use regulations, section 3.325, mixed use buildings and article 12 definitions. Discussion and review of proposed revisions and possible revote on recommendation to town council. Chris, I would like you to introduce this. So I think Nate is going to give some introductory remarks, but I wanted to say that um, you did vote to recommend um, the mixed use building um, a zoning amendment on, I think it was August 18th. Yep. And um, since then, we've had some discussions here about uh, the lack of clarity in the description of non-residential um, use. And we've realized that um, the bylaw as it was recommended on the 18th was not clear in the way that um, non-residential use could be interpreted. And so we went back and tried to figure out how we could make it better. Um, and that involved um, splitting out some uses like common space, et cetera. Um, and so we are coming back to you. You've seen uh, versions of this um, over, the, over the last, what is it, month, two months now, um, and you haven't actually had a chance to discuss it. Um, and it, it has evolved further. So Nate can talk about its further evolution, but I just wanted to put that in context. So we're, you, you've made a recommendation and we're coming back to you with a uh, revised proposal and ask you to make a recommendation on the revised proposal. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. So Nate, I guess it's uh, your turn. Sure, thanks. It's also the, the CRC is holding a new hearing on mixed use as well. You know, the planning board. And this will be October, over October 26th as well? Right, so the planning board doesn't necessarily have to hold a new hearing, but the timing um, requirements uh, do hold to the community resource committee. So there wasn't a recommendation made uh, within the time frame allowed. So they're, they're issuing, you know, they issued a new notice and uh, public hearing for next week. Okay. And so yeah, Chris is right. So I was gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. So the, on October, um, August 18th, the planning board recommended the amendment at that time. And then in the packet for September 1st, and then for September 14th, there were, um, you know, updates to the mixed use bylaw in the packet, but were never discussed. And then now it's here tonight. And so you know, there are incremental changes on the 1st and the 14th, and then tonight that are all consolidated into one. Um, but I just wanna show the, the 18th um, amendment, you know, where, um, you know, this is formatted as it, as it was, uh, it's from the packet on August 18th. And so we'd be, you know, we wouldn't be changing the permitting um, in, the, in the zoning districts, that remains the same we'd be removing the standards and conditions in the use chart and then providing um, you know, these, these five standards and then a definition. And so on the 18th, we said no more than 60% of the gross flare area of the first, first or ground floor shall be a combination of residential use or parking, including incidental or associated spaces. And then we have the 40% gross flare area for um, any permitted non-residential use other than parking. And so that's a minimum. So it could be more, but you know, at least 40%. Um, as Chris mentioned, this includes incidental and associated spaces. And since the 18th year, there's been there was some discussion about could this 40% also be split amongst um, different buildings or how would that be calculated if there are two buildings on a site? Uh, could the 40% be spread out over, you know, two floors? Um, you know what you know so if someone wants to have some upper floor uses uh, it also didn't include common space so there's been some discussions about if there's a common lobby hallway elevators other things could um you know how that be calculated to the toward the 40 percent um so those you know these standards have been updated um you know any dwelling units located uh, and enclosed parking on the first or ground floor shall be located at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public way or walkways, uh, that's, that was in there on the 18th. Um, sloping lots, lots with frontage on more than one right of way. The permit granting authority shall determine what is the, um, 
you know, really the first floor or ground floor. And then we're proposing a bedroom count, uh, a mix of bedroom sizes um, consistent with apartments so that no more than 50% uh, of the total dwelling units shall have the same bedroom count, um, you know, except for uh, mixed use buildings with less than 10 units. Uh, and we're also proposing an art uh, definition in Article 12. A mixed use building is a building containing one or more dwelling units in combination with permitted non residential uses. So, you know, in our bylaw, we don't uh, define a live work building or if it's two units or one non uh, residential use. And so, really, any combination of those would be a mixed use building. And so, you know, it's just a broader, it's a, it's a definition that would apply to any, any, um, any combination. And so, this, this, uh, bylaw amendment was recommended. Um, and since then we've uh, staff uh, you know have made a few changes. It was in the packet and it's really shown and highlighted in yellow. And so um, you know I think there's a few um, a few differences here. We're, now we're saying, um, I'll start with the 30% here. We're saying now at least 30% of the gross floor area of the ground floor or first floor shall be a permitted non-residential use other than parking, including incidental spaces. Um, and this is the new changes. So these, some of these changes were in the packet on the 1st and the 14th, and it's been consolidated now, um, except that the permit granting authority may allow the required non-residential uses to be distributed on any floor or in any multi building of a multiple building development on the same parcel, provided that the portion of the ground floor or first floor of any building facing the street be occupied predominantly by such non-residential uses. And um, you know, what this means is that the 40% the 30% could be split between floors um, so long as the, the ground or first floor facing the street be predominantly occupied by the non-residential use. And street is a defined term in the zoning bylaw. So before we had said areas customarily used by the public or walkways, and that was somewhat confusing. Um, and so really, you know, this is trying to get at having, um, you know, a majority of the street side um, be non-residential use, active non-residential use. And this is something that would be discussed during permitting. You know, what does predominantly mean? Um, we've also added this section for the purposes of this section, incidental spaces shall not include common areas shared by multiple uses or other spaces not contiguous to the non-residential use unless the space is included in the description of the premises leased to the non-residential tenant. Uh, and we did this, for instance, um, we did, you know, someone could try to satisfy the 40% by having uh, some space along the street and then having storage in the back of the building or having you know, incidental or common spaces that they would count towards this, uh, the non-residential gross floor area, um, but it really doesn't achieve what we wanted. I, I have some illustrations that could, um, that'll help explain this. And so really this 30% now of the gross floor area is active non-residential use. So it's really, um, although it's a, a smaller percentage than before, it's, it is actually, um, you know, it takes away any of the common spaces or other incidental spaces that could be counted towards that, what was the 40%. Uh, and so we, we changed the 70% here of the first or ground floor shall be residential use, parking, or common areas shared by multiple uses. So basically anything other than the non-residential use is now calculated as part of the 70%. And so that helps clarify that calculation. Um, the other conditions are the same. Uh, except that we've now used the defined term of street. So dwelling units and parking would be um, at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the street. And same thing for sloping lots with frontage on more than one street. So we, you know, that's a defined term that we wanted to use. And the definition is still the same, one or more dwelling units. Um, and so the text in yellow is what's changed from the 18th, some of this was in the, um, the CRC recommended um, earlier that the permit granting authority allow units to be distributed or the, the space be distributed on any floor. And that was gonna come back to the planning board um, in September, but it, you know, we never discussed it. So this, you know, this 
um, you know, most of this uh, change was in a previous version that was in the packet. Okay, is that it? Oh, are you? No, or no, I just want to. Uh, there's okay, an good. illustration here that good. Um, I th hopefully can help. So, you know, there's two examples of a mixed use building. So currently in the bylaw, the um, the October version, you know, 30%, it's a minimum 30% uh, be non-residential use, including incidental space or um, that is contiguous with the active non-residential use or non-contiguous space that may have a lease agreement. And then, you know, no more than 70% could be residential parking or common areas. And so here's a, an actual building, um, Beacon Street in Boston, and you know the color coding the 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 pink is the commercial or the non-residential space the blue is the common spaces and the yellow is residential and so um you know right now the the retail is 45 to 50 percent of the floor area of the first floor um it's more than the minimum 30 percent it's just this is an illustration um but before without defining the common areas, there could be an argument made that half of the blue space or more would actually be considered part of the retail because they would say, oh, well, you know, this hallway is being used to get to the back door of this retail space or people who come into the building to use the non-residential space may be using the stairwell and walking through here. Um, and so we've clarified that to say that any of this hallway space doesn't count toward the, the you know the thirty percent anymore, and so someone can't try to you know say well half this common space is really part of this calculation. And again, here's another uh, mixed use building from Portland. It's a little bit more um, complex. Uh, and again, the red is the non-residential space. The blue is common, and the yellow here is parking. It could be considered residential. And what this is showing is there are storage areas here and here in the back. There's bike storage here. Uh, there's trash here. There's a there's a lobby that's common to could get into some of the retail spaces, but it's also for residents. So there's a mail room here. There's elevators. And so in this example, an applicant could have said, "Well, we think most of this lobby is actually going to serve one or two businesses. We think this hallway is really used for." You know, half of the space could be counted toward the retail square footage calculation. And we're now defining it as common area that's considered part of the 70% calculation. And you know, in this example, if we said, okay, well, half this blue area could be considered part of um, the non-residential calculation, in effect, you'd be losing a, a significant amount of square foot that's actively used for you know, a business or commercial or office use. And so staff thinks that those um, changes in the language help with you know, how an applicant would measure and how a board would review those calculations. Um, you know, for instance, if this storage area back here where the cursor is, if, that's, if you, people can see that, if that was in a lease agreement that you know, this retail space was using this as part of their inventory storage, then that could be counted as part of the 30%, but it would have to be shown at time of application that there's a lease agreement that that space is part of the, the non-residential use. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's it right now. Um, like I said, the CRC made a recommendation as well back um, in September, and they're gonna be looking at this again uh, next week to, you know, to take up this new version. Thanks, Nate. I wanna, Mention that the time is 9.21 and Andrew has arrived. Just for the minutes. I got there um, about 15 minutes ago. Okay, great, thank you. Working. Uh, let's see. Chris, do you wanna say anything else about this? I know your hand is not up, but before we get into the conversation. I, I don't think so at this time, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Janet, you had your hand up for a while. Do you wanna? So I, I'm, I found this new language almost hopelessly confusing. 
And so if it was meant to clarify something, I just got lost and I read it over and over again. And so I think um, I don't understand it. And I, I sort of understand your explanation, but I don't think this language clarifies what you're trying to get to. Um, and so I, I was just thinking, you could just say no common spaces will be counted as non-residential use. You know, that could just be a simple line um, because the word incidental kind of shows up and it's incidental to residential use or non-residential use. And it just, it just swam around the paragraphs to me in a way that I just couldn't understand. And so, you know, anyway, I, I tried hard. And so um, I, I think the CRC is trying, has, was suggested reducing the non, the non-residential, the, the commercial space from 40% to 30%. I mean, I think that's where it comes from. I don't think it comes from planning department staff. And so I don't support that. I, I thought we should do 60% for commercial uses, um, not 30%. And I kind of, I, I did go to one of the CRC meetings and I do agree with Steve Schreiber. You know, it was like too confusing to have the space kind of wandering around. You lose the, the, the street, street front um, part of the buildings, the commercial street front. And the language was just confusing. And so if somebody has 40% commercial on the first floor and wants to do a rooftop restaurant, that will stand on its own legs. If they can make money doing that, they'll do that. You know, we don't have to have every building be mostly residential. It could be a mix, but we do have to have a strong commercial presence on the first floor. So I'm sticking with Steve, what I said at that meeting. And I just, but I think the language you put in here, I just, I was just lost in it. Um, and I do, I do understand the change to street. That seems super clear. So those are my three points. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Any other comments? And I have a couple of questions for Nate. Um, uh, Chris. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the um, going from 40% to 30%. And that was not something that originated in the CRC. It originated in the planning department and with uh, Rob Mora and the planning staff. Um, when we started to look at um, taking out any portion of the common space, um, it, we realized that um, you know the, the net result would be approximately the same, whether you had 40% um, that included common space or 30% that didn't include common space. Um, we also had heard from, and I think Janet was part of this conversation that, um, uh, Gabrielle Gould felt that 40% um, was way too much and that nobody would ever be able to fill that. So that was also part of the mix of the conversation that we had. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that it came from the planning department staff and from Rob Mora. It didn't come from CRC and they haven't had an opportunity to review this yet. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say right now. Okay. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, and Chris, thanks for adding that, that Gabby Gould did mention that. That that surprised me a little bit. I, um, it does sort of seem like we're going the wrong direction, but that makes sense when you describe it as like the trade off of 30% plus the common is equal to the 40%. But the notion that we couldn't put 40%, that 40% is too high seems a little, seems a little far fetched unless we're really building out, you know, really massive um, buildings that are just going from property line to property line. Um, it, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that it, it's, sorry, I don't really have a question here, but just as a thought, it just seems like we're, we're, we're moving further and further away from having the, the really vibrant downtown and, and building out areas, which just really could be primarily residential. Thanks. Chris? Yeah, I just remembered what the other thing I wanted to say is that incidental space and common space are different. Common space is shared space, space that's shared by the different uses in the building. Incidental space would be things like um, storage for a retail place or, you know, the back um, part of the kitchen in a restaurant or, you know, just places that public wouldn't go to but are associated with a specific use. So that's what incidental space is. And incidental space is included in this 30%, but common space is not included because that's shared space. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, Maria. Uh, it's more of a clarification, Nate. Uh, so you, you talked about the 40 going to 30, but then you kind of folded in a part about the, um, uh, as long as most of the retails um, predominantly occupying the street side on the first floor, but then how did that relate to um, like multiple buildings and other places other than the first floor? Is that like uh, basically a developer or property owner can do whatever they want beyond the 40, uh, beyond the 30% minimum? Or how did the other locations relate to this change sure. in percentage? Sure, so the 30% you know, is a minimum and the requirement is so that at least 30% of the building has to be non-residential and the ground or first floor facing the street has to be predominant, you know, predominantly that, that use, non-residential use. And so, you know, what we, what we determine is that if someone wants to do two floors of, um, or, you know, have non-residential uses on two floors, you know, it could be an excess of 30%, but they could just be at 30% and still meet that requirement. And so the way the bylaw was written previously is that the 40% had to only be on the ground floor. And so if you're going on, if you're putting a second floor of non-residential use, that would have to be basically beyond the 40%. And so now we're allowing that 30% to be distributed uh, so long as the streetscape is still maintained as a non-residential use. And, um, you know, staff talked about having some other requirements there, you know, like so much of the frontage be built out, you know, you know, at, you know, there's different ways to phrase it, but, you know, we left it as predominantly um, non-residential because that's something the permit granting authority can really discuss, you know, what is appropriate for each building and each site. Um, um, I guess I don't, Maria, is that legacy hand? Well, I get, it's sort of following up. So um, say you have 100 feet of frontage and 30% of it is retail, but say you have some on the second floor, then is it 15% per floor? <laughs> Am I doing that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that becomes, you know, an applicant would have to describe if they have, you know, a, a 5,000 square foot building then you know they need 30 percent of it has to be non-residential use ah, okay, and okay. Then, you know you know and then if there's multiple buildings on a property it's the first floor of say there's two buildings and they're both five thousand square feet then it's ten thousand square feet so you have three thousand square feet have to be non-residential i see right right because yeah of course uh area is different than frontage so you could have the majority of frontage even though it's a less percentage, percentage of okay gotcha okay all right, all right thank you well, that gets into one question I had, uh, which had to do with multiple building developments, because it seemed like the, the gross floor area of the first or ground floor was kind of ambiguous, whether it was only applying to buildings that had frontage on the street or buildings that didn't and would be counted. So I think that that seemed a little bit like something we'd we could get into a fight about and it wouldn't have a clear answer. Um, and I guess uh, the word predominant, you know, I mean, I'm kind of thinking about the parking conversation we had where we were comfortable having conversation about what was adequate. Uh, and I guess I'm imagining that this might be another common topic of conversation about what's predominant. Um, which, you know, I guess I'm not sure I'm crazy about, but I guess I wonder what other people think. Um, I, I was surprised to see the allowance for distributing the required area onto multiple floors, um, because I thought we were pretty clear that we wanted the non-residential use to enliven the street. And, you know, it's not going to do anything for the street if it moves upstairs or downstairs. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm kind of tepid about this, this, this change. Um, yeah, think, just quickly, Doug, I think there's still a requirement that the first floor be non-residential use and that it occupy, you know, a majority of the street 
front edge. So, you know, that still has to be satisfied. And then if they need to go, you know, if they haven't reached the 30% that way and they wanted to do a second floor use, they could. Uh -huh. So it's, there's still a requirement that the street be non-residential use. Okay. Okay, uh, Janet, it looks like your hand was next. Yes, I, I have a two part question or so um, I, I think, I don't know if I misheard you, Nate, or um, when you were answering Maria. So 30% of what? So is it 30% of the first floor area or 30% of the entire area of all the, the building or all the buildings? Well, so it's, you know, if there's one building, it's 30% of that, the floor area, right? So if it's a 5,000 square foot building, then it's 30% of that building. If there's two buildings, it's 30% of both buildings. But, but, but it's, only, it's only the first floor. Right, right, right. It's only the, right, the first, right, the footprint, the, you know, the gross floor area of that, of the first floor. It's okay, always, that's the way it's always been calculated. So if so, the first floor is 5,000 square feet, it's a percentage of that. So it's 30% of 5,000 can be distributed throughout one building or several buildings, as long as the predominant view or whatever on the is on the street. There's some stores on the street. I, I, I'm just kind of, anyway, okay. So I understand that, I guess I just, uh, so I looked up predominant and it says presents as the strongest or main element having or exerting control or power. And so I think it is um, a really fuzzy word. And so I'm just kind of, so I'm not, I, I don't understand. Um, it'd be hard to see that if you had 30% of your first floor area spread around several, several floors, you know, okay, so then you have to have a something in the front to make it predominantly commercial. But most stores, you know, or most restaurants, use a lot, go back a lot. They use a lot of the space. I mean, I don't know if you're just gonna have some, a, a row of ATMs or small, you know, shops or tiny shops that don't, you know. So I just, I'm kind of, I don't know, I don't get it. Um, the other thing is in terms of incidental, I wonder if you need it, if you need to define it or even use it. So if I have a restaurant and the front of my restaurant is seating and the back of my restaurant is kitchen, I don't think anyone, and then there's storage behind it. I don't think anyone would disagree that the kitchen and the storage was part of the restaurant. It's not incidental to it. It's part of the restaurant. And so if I had a shop and the whole front part of it is, you know, displaying items and down a hallway in the back, I have some storage for my clothes. That's not really incidental. It's part of your shop. And so I, I don't know if you can have to kind of make incidental. Why do we need it there? And then it, it just sort of wanders around paragraphs in a really confusing way. So I'm wondering if there's a way to simplify this. Nate, yeah. Nate, does the incidental come into play when the, say the storage is not contiguous with the rest of the leased area? It does. I think most, a lot of mixed use bylaws do define incidental because I think otherwise you might be getting people who will, you know, um, you know, not have a very big active space, but then have incidental space to count towards their that percentage, right? The utility room, the mop sink, the storage that is, you know, down the hall past residential uses. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, in uh, the last example you gave Janet, where the store has inventory, you know, that incidental space, depending on how, where it is, may not count towards the 30%. And so I think it is important to have that in there because otherwise, I think, you know, when, when the previous bylaw was proposed, staff discussed it with different different people and you know there you know we were learning of ways to to get around that calculation right of how to have it um how to have an argument that incidental spaces could be actually almost half the active retail space so you you know in essence you'd only have 20 percent of your floor area be active and the other 20 percent would be incidental space and so we're really trying to define it in a way that um you know limits that ability All right, uh, Tom. Um, I, I heard, uh, thanks, Doug. I heard um, 
Gabrielle talk about this opportunity to move um, some of that ground floor square footage up into the building and distribute it. And I, I saw value in that, but I, I'm, I'm also concerned about the 30% being divvied up over multiple floors and how that could be exploited. And that, as someone mentioned, could have a really big facade with ATMs on the ground floor and you know something on the second floor that's offices or whatnot, and it really won't contribute to the liveliness of the the ground uh, floor experience along the street. So I, I have some hesitancy about that being an unrestricted rule. That as long as you know the predominant facade. I, I don't I, I guess I see I see too many as a creative person I see too many ways to get around that and I I don't feel like it's contributing to what we're trying to achieve here I think we did reduce to 30 percent from um, where we started and a lot of push for more um, and I was okay with getting down to 40 and now I'm okay with getting down to 30 with the understanding of this other space but I'm, I'm not so sure that giving up the ground floor, uh, act, active ground floor is what we want to do in this particular case. So this yeah, so is my, I, my thoughts on that. Sure, yeah, I don't think we're giving up the active ground floor because it still needs to be, most of the street facing facades still need to be active non-residential. Um, I also think it's then part of the permit granting authority's ability to ask for that during permitting. And so, you know, you could ask an applicant to present a different design if they come in showing something that doesn't enliven the street. It's the permit granting authority's ability to say we want to see a better design. And so, um, I think I think, I think Nate, I'd rather see a waiver for that. I'd rather have them say, "Oh, we can't fit it all on the first floor. Here's why. Let's get an application to to do something different." You know, and that might be to me that I feel more comfortable asserting that we want this on the ground floor rather than creating the loophole up front and we might ask people to prove that they need something different thanks tom andrew thanks doug um i i agree with uh, something janet said earlier about you know the the notion of incidental space you know the retail lease would include the back of house um for storage or, or kitchen whatever i think that to me that is also like clearly would be part of the retail I actually, I, I like the idea also of second floor, well, I'm not sure I should say also, I like the idea of second floor um, commercial use in that, you know, I think I mentioned this in one other meeting that, you know, the active street front is more about the frontage than the square footage. I think like it's, it's walking down the street and seeing being presented with things, right? So like a bowling alley configured shape is not adding as much value as like something that's really broad. Um, so I, I like the idea of, of um, you know, inviting second floor. I had a question though, because if, if there was any second floor use, they would need to have elevators. So would the elevator, what would that count towards? Because if we're thinking about spaces that are, you know, four or 5,000 square foot um, floor plans, you know, they're going to they're gonna eat up a, a fair amount for the vertical transportation. So what would that count towards? Yeah, I think if that's a common elevator, then it counts as common space and not toward the 30%. If it's an elevator that is, you know, um, distinct to that upper floor use, then it would count towards the, you know, that 30% or that non-residential use square footage. Okay, so if the elevator was for the retail use, it would count towards that space, that, that, would, that would count as retail space. Yeah, right, but typically if it's, you know, if it's a, you know, if there's an elevator that has a common, you know, it's shared by all, you know, all tenants, residential, non-residential in a building, then, you know, that's a common space and it's not, you know, it doesn't count towards that 30%. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Maria. I think I finally get it, Nate. So basically <laughs> you haven't changed what the bylaw is asking as far as how much street frontage you want. Um, it's just reducing that sort of square footage um, definition as far as like which uses count for that uh, square footage of 30 versus 40. And you're saying it's kind of a wash because you've now defined enough things to go um, back out of that, um, how am I explaining this, back out of that non, 
residential portion. Um, anyways, I think some of my confusion might have caused more confusion, but you're not actually reducing the amount of street frontage. You're just reducing sort of what counts toward that square footage on the first floor to hit as far as the minimum of 30%. And I think what's also kind of mudding thing is that you are suddenly throwing all these other things in about like where it can be located. And so there's this worry like, oh, now our first floor is even less retail, but actually it's the same frontage retail, ideally. Um, it's just now, now you're giving a little bit more sort of flexibility as far as um, making sure someone doesn't come in and um, like cheat the system and try to put more sort of storage space and say, well, we hit the 40 because, you know, even though we did with, us with, with back of house storage or mostly with common hallway or you've eliminated that sort of loophole in a way. So it, it, it still seems safe, but I do hear a lot of people just saying, oh my gosh, we're losing first floor retail. And um, maybe there's a way to clarify it somehow so that people don't feel that because that was my first gut. I thought, wait a minute, are we losing anything really? And I had to do some math and figure out what you were defining as far as street face versus area versus. So maybe there's a way just to, I don't know, uh, maybe it is semantics or um, some things that Janet touched on about like using words that are a little less um, loaded maybe. Um, I agree predominant is very open-ended, but then we we're also in previous meetings, I remember we were saying, well, don't be so prescriptive with like an exact, you know, linear footage of street frontage because every parcel is different. So, so yeah, it's a hard line to walk because you, you on one hand want to <laughs> be definitive about what it is you want, but then not so much that some parcels are penalized. So um, I don't know, I, I guess I, I don't feel like, you know, this is something that's, necessarily um, taking away from our street liveliness. Um, honestly, I, I don't think that this is doing that because um, what you're saying, but I think maybe the word predominant maybe is, you know, that's our only thing we have our to, to hang our hat on, right? As far as guaranteeing that we still have that active street front. So um, I don't know, I guess with all these shifting numbers, it's it just feels like, Oh, are we losing that? But I, I don't think we are, but maybe there's a way to strengthen the sort of street frontage predominant definition somehow. How that is, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but I feel like, yeah, a lot of a lot of concern is about something that's maybe not actually there, if that makes sense. Uh, Chris, um, how badly do you need us to vote on this? Um, so normally the CRC tells us that they like to have the planning board recommendation before they make their recommendation. Um, on the other hand, you know, they're meeting on the 26th and if they make a recommendation that night, the planning board could meet on November 3rd. Is that right? Yeah, November 3rd is the date of your first meeting in November and talk about this then and you could probably have a recommendation before this this actually gets to town council. I'm not sure when it's going to get to town council, but probably sometime in um, late November or early December. Well, I guess what I was really asking was, what if you don't get another recommendation from us? Oh, well, then we live with what we've got from uh, August. <laughs> And that um, poses problems. I think it would pose problems to the building commissioner as far as interpretation, but um, he's very smart and he can probably figure it out. But you well, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking more about, you know, obviously there's some misgivings here on the board tonight. Um, you do have a timeline. Uh, if, if you just end up at the town council with one version from CRC and another from planning board, does town council have the ability to decide which one they like or pick, you know, edit to be in the middle or something? I think that's going to be a challenge for them. I uh -huh. don't have as much opportunity to discuss things as you do. Okay. So we really need to kind of run this to ground and um, decide whether we like it. Either tonight or November 3rd. Right. Preferably tonight, but. Right. 
um, and how open are you to us changing this language? I mean, do you simply want an up or down? We like this or we don't? No, so, I mean, I'll, I'll speak. I think, you know, I agree that there, you know, although the language, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of language added. I think there are, you know, a number of pieces that have changed in terms of, as we've said, the distribution amongst floors, um, you know, the 30% um, predominantly along the street. Um, so, you know, the predominant, um, that description. So I think, you know, multiple buildings on a, on a property. So I think there are a number of pieces that have been added. Um, you know, I think, you know, the defining of common space and incidental space. So I think, um, you know, I do think it is a lot to, to come to an agreement on this evening. And so, I mean, I, you know, I've taken a page of notes and I feel like, you know, it would take some some time with staff to discuss how can we address some of these questions and refine the language, um, you know, and then if there's still more discussion to be had. So I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know, I feel like we were getting, you know, I feel like there was some common themes that were being presented that we could discuss on how to, you know, refine the bylaw. All right, so you, you're you open to taking our comments from this evening and coming back on the third? I would be. I see Chris nodding and okay. So, all right, so thank you both. Um, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm just interested in the in the uh, conceptual model where the developer wants to put all their marble marbles, <clears throat> say on the rooftop situation, but yet they still, you know, per this, you know, propose, you know, the way the language is right now, they need something along the storefront. So minimally along, you know, the the street front there for a building, what? You know what would pass and what would allow you know the flexibility for for the developer to you know to go with something on 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 you know more on the upper floors versus the you know 30 percent on the first floor well isn't that going to be a question for 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 each planning board to consider when they see a design for each mixed use building you know, do we think that whatever's happening at the first floor street is qualifies as predominant? Yeah, I'm just, I guess conceptually, I'm wondering what that would be, though, for, you know, if in a, in a, you know, minimalist sort of first floor frontage thing, what would that be? If, you know, all, you know, the development of a you know, multi use building was was on, uh, you know, second or, you know, you no know, top floor of the building. I'm just trying to get a feel for that. Yeah, can I just say quickly, Doug, Jack, I think that's a really good question because, you know, staff, we, you know, for instance, some bylaws will say that, you know, it's 85% of the frontage of the building or 85% of the lot needs to be developed as non-residential to a depth of say 20 feet or 40 feet. But, you know, we felt that getting that, those types of parameters in there, <clears throat> could actually you know, discourage some other uses. So if we just said 20 feet deep, then now you're gonna get something that's 20 feet deep where a restaurant might need 50 feet. And so it's kind of difficult to have a number of um, kind of parameters that you know, may exclude some possibilities. And so I, I understand the language we have here is a little, um, you know, I think Janet said fuzzy. Um, some of that was to have some flexibility on part of the applicant and as part of the review from the planning board to be able to have those discussions on a, you know, on a project application. Um, but I think, you know, yes, yeah, an interesting question. What, what could, what's the minimum an applicant could do, right? Along the street really is what you're asking if they wanna have yes. most of that 30% on an upper floor. Yep. Okay. Um, Janet? So I'm I'm going back to the um, multiple buildings. So if you had three buildings on your lot, can you spread your thirty percent of the? Does it have to be thirty percent of the first floor of each building? That's the count, or just the building fronting the street? 
think of it as, you know, not, well, the way staff was expecting it is 30% of every each building. So it's 30% of the gross floor area of the first floor of all buildings. Okay, because that's not clear. Um, I would be really helped when we come back to this to have a chart with a split screen with what we approved, I think back in August, and then the length, the the language on the other side that you know either it's longer but it's addressing the issue in a different way because I thought the stuff we I you know I still think we should do more than forty percent but I kind of under I thought I understood what we approved and I I'm just struggling to understand this language I find it very confusing so I think it'd be helpful to me to see you know what we approved and what you're asking us to approve um, and then I think we're all struggling to understand the meaning of it. And then I do sort of dread, you know, passing on to planning boards or ZBAs of the future, this struggle of like, what's the minimum amount in the front. And I think it's, I mean, I think, you know, Maria, please correct me, but I think you have said it's hard to convert space from commercial to residential or residential to commercial. I can't remember which, but I think we would like to leave the first floor able for different commercial uses, not just, you know, hone for, you know, you know, you want to see a restaurant or a bookshop or that space to be flexible because we've seen that over time, over hundreds of years, different businesses come and go. And so we might be constraining too much by putting a lot of residential on the first floor with, you know, 20% on fourth floor and, you know, whatever, but, you know, it's just, it just seems, you know, what do we, you know, what's the best thing for our business, businesses and small businesses through time. So, but I think a side-by-side -side chart, chart would help me because I'm kind of lost here. And Thanks, I, I, I... Uh, Tom. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that I think the, the only thing that I'm really concerned about is the distribution of buildings and the distribution of floors. But I, I'm, I just wanted to clarify that I understand where the 30% is coming from and what trade-offs are being made. And I understand what is and isn't changing in the other language regarding the incidentals. I just think we want to put the onus on the, the, the developer to convince us as to why we can't have those commercial uses on the ground floor. And I can see reasons why those are compelling to do that. Um, I think the predominant language is, is probably okay to give us a leg to pressure them, but I still think that we want to we want to push them to convince us otherwise, as opposed to the other way around. So that's that's how I was approaching that. Okay, Chris. I just wanted to mention the possibility of a special permit. That's something that I've been kind of talking about in the office and, um, you know, people are sort of suspicious of special permits. They think the planning board grants all the special permits and that the ZBA does too, and that doesn't really mean anything, but um, it's another way to approach this. If we wanted to allow flexibility and not have to, you know, kind of go through the gyrations of the language that we're trying to come up with now, um, would it be useful to try to think about how a special permit might be able to help us to make this more flexible? Um, so anyway, I'm just gonna plant that seed. I mean, if, if, if you're thinking, you know, the space that we could initially mandate on the first floor, could we could potentially allow it on other floors through special permit, uh, I think that would, get at what Tom is uh, advocating and uh, looks like he agrees with me. Um, and and I, I think that would be, that would go a ways to uh, satisfying some of my concerns. Uh, so it's just about 10 o'clock. Uh, it sounds like it would be okay for us to come back to this uh, November 3rd. Chris, do we have a, a particularly full agenda that night? Or, or Pam. Well, you have another. You have another park. Um, another zoning bylaw that night, which is the parking bylaw. Um, we were trying to kind of 
distribute the zoning right. so you wouldn't have like a whole night of zoning. But that is one thing that's on your agenda for the third. Is the are, there, are there any uh, specific, you know, actual projects looking for site plan reviews or anything? No, there won't be because so, um, so at the moment it would just be the zoning bylaws. Yeah. And there's only the two. There would be the two if you continue this public hearing. And right. by the way, I don't know if you wanted to take public comment. Right. Until you decide to. Yeah. You know, yep. Right. OK. Um, so I don't see any more hands from the board. We have an attendee hand up. Uh, Pam Rooney, why don't you give us your name and your address? Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I want to say thank you. Actually, oops, you only gave me one minute. No, um, I'm resetting. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> um, I, I want to just say thank you for actually letting the public speak again. I think my comment uh, tonight is that I continue to feel very strongly that the that the the, the long night of four um, zoning bylaws being discussed and, and the public hearings being held and closed all in one night was was just nonsense. When clearly this particular bylaw has had so many tweaks and reorganizations and continuing to sort of mull it over and, and make it something better. And I just want to say, I think in the future, can we please guard against the rush to try to have a public hearing and close it uh, in order you know, to avoid having the public being able to weigh in. Um, I guess I would, my actual comment on this particular bylaw, um, it, it, it seems like it's going in the wrong direction. And I think I would, I would still feel strongly to say, let's have 40% be non-commercial, I mean, non-residential use, um, not counting any additional common space, but you provide 40% of actual factual uh, non-residential space. And let's not let it slide. Uh, having a waiver for uh, a request to put some of that square footage on another floor makes sense, but I would say don't give it to them to begin with. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Uh, next we have John W. Hi, John. All right, everybody hear me? Yes, please give us your name and your address. Hi, right. yeah, John Robleski. I own property on the corner of Gray and Main Street and Main Street. Um, seems like all this uh, talk about the mixed use and um, changing this bylaw is pretty much geared to the downtown area where you want to enliven the streetscape and where there's a lot of foot traffic. And I'm a little concerned about having that apply to the outlying neighborhood business um, where you don't get that foot traffic. And there's a, some spaces that is uh, available for rent. And I think it's going to be a harder place to try to find tenants to rent office space or commercial space is primarily in that area, Gray and Main and High uh, Triangle Street. That's primarily residential. And I think more residential is needed there where they can walk to these services in the downtown area. Uh, the other thing is, have you considered existing or pre-existing mixed use buildings and how they're impacted? Uh, with a change in a bylaw like this. I have one there on the corner of Main and Gray. And there's a lot of frontage setback there that could be used for residential versus more business that uh, may not attract much. And to some of the small businesses that I've seen and had in one of the properties next door are small office areas, and they don't necessarily need that frontage exposure. 
a lot of them attorneys, that type of thing would rather be toward the back and have parking and ADA access and all that. So I guess I'm just asking that you put a little bit of thought into the BN district and how that's affected by this. And it's really not gonna enlighten the streetscape by having some businesses on a, the direct frontage there. Because people really walk to the bus stop or they walk uptown, they walk to Amherst College or up to UMass or the local schools. So I think it's just a little bit different. And uh, also the issue there on the corner of Main and Gray is I have the frontage on both streets. So uh, as far as working that out. So those are my thoughts and uh, just ask you that I might take a look at that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, so I don't see any more public comment. Um, you know, Nate, do you want to take some of those comments into into consideration as you think about this over the next week or so, week or two? Sure. Yeah. No, I think there's been some good comments and discussion tonight, and I think you know I'll I can work with staff on on amendments, you know, on changes to this amendment. Okay. Great. So. Um, I guess why don't we just uh, continue this to November third? We're not in a formal public hearing, so we don't need to vote. I don't think, um, but we'll expect you to come back that night. Uh, let's see, Jack. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I, I'd, I'd really you know like to hear from you know the business you know. Um, section of, of town, whether it be Gabrielle Gould or um, the Amherst Chamber, but I'd like to get their input on this. I, I'm sure that, that Nate has consulted with them, but it'd be nice to have their input, you know, with our final sort of re review. All right. Thanks, Jack. Okay, so why don't we move on from this? Um, that's the end of, uh, are there, are there any topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting under old business? No, there are not. No. Okay. Any under new business? Not that I know of. All right. Form A, A and R subdivision applications. Mm. No, not tonight. Okay. Upcoming ZBA applications. Yes. We do. We do. And Pam, do you want to tackle this or do you want me to tackle it? Um, well, I can bring up the screen, Chris, and yeah. okay. we can, would, whichever you, I mean, I have these bullet points here that you can pretty much read. Yeah, so Pam worked with um, Maureen Pollock on this, and this is very helpful. Um, we are bringing this application, the CBA application, to you because it's so large, and we thought you might be interested in reviewing it. Um, it's a proposal for a, a solar um, array PV installation in the northeast corner of town. Um, it's along Shootsbury Road. Um, east of Henry Street and east of Northeast Street. Um, it's, it's pretty large. It's three contiguous parcels off Shootsbury Road, um, and they're all owned by WD Coles, and it's in the outlying residential district. Um, the solar array requires a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, it's currently a working forest, so it would require um, a fair amount of, of cutting of trees. Um, it's about, it's almost 100 acres. And the disturbance would be a little bit less than half of the site. Um, it's outlined in blue here. Pam uh, drew up this yep. um, map here to show you where it is. So um, it, it, it will be contiguous with another project in Shootsbury. Uh, that's my understanding, or at least another project that will be close by, um, by the same company. But um, obviously the town of Amherst won't be 
reviewing that. And um, there's a notice of intent that's been filed with the Conservation Commission because there are wetlands on the site. So the wetlands um, public hearing will be opened next Wednesday, October 27th. So our question to you is, um, would you like to have um, the opportunity to have a presentation on this project and um, make recommendations to the ZBA? Um, so that's, that's the question. All right, uh, I see Janet's hand. Um, I would vote yes. It seems such like such a significant project um, with all sorts of impacts and that's it. All right, uh, Tom. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the scale of it is something we, it'd be nice to get a look at and have a conversation about. Um, it is kind of off the beaten path, but it, um, it does butt up against what looks like a series of residential plots um, along the north side of that site there. So um, I think it's worth taking a look at. Okay. And um, gee, I thought I saw Johanna's Nick. And I had it up, but I echo Janet and Tom's sentiment that we should take a look at it. All right. So that's that's at least three members and um, that seems like sufficient that Chris, why don't we put that on the agenda? Mm -hmm. okay. when, when is the ZBA hearing? We don't have a date for the ZBA hearing yet. All we have is a date for the Conservation Commission. Um, Maureen okay. and um, Rob Mora are looking at the application for the ZBA. I'm not even sure if it's been filed with the town clerk yet, but I wanted to bring it, we wanted to bring it to your attention early so you could you know, make a plan to look at it. Okay, great. All right, uh, any other applications you wanted to talk to us about, Chris? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Up upcoming SPP, SPR, SUV applications? Um, you have a new application from Amherst College. Um, they're going to be bringing some signs to you. I think it's uh, three signs that didn't make it into the first um, review. And so that will be coming to you probably November 17th. Okay. And there are other things that are out there in the wings, but we haven't actually received applications for those things. All right. All right. Um, planning board committee and liaison reports. How about the PVC, PC, Jack? Yeah, I, I believe that um, Chris Brestrup forwarded a, um, a link to, you know, the state of, of uh, infrastructure projects, you know, in Western Massachusetts on a state perspective and how difficult it is for some of the more poor towns. So that, that was a, a you know, we had a meeting last Thursday and that was a very, you know, a, a moving presentation by, uh, it was Suzanne Bump who's the state auditor there. And the other thing that, that was presented was there's uh, ARPA funding available and, you know, it, that can apply to, you know, housing downtown, you know, assisting, you know, the digital sort of divide there that, that might be happening more in the hill towns and, and tourism, things like that. So again, I'm sure, uh, Chris, you're aware of of the potential of that funding and the flexibility of it. But th those are two things that were discussed. So. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Andrew, anything on CPAC? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, we do, we've got, um, so there are 18 applications, five for community housing, six for uh, historic preservation, none for open space and seven for recreation. Um, so we have, we have received uh, applications from those 18 folks. Uh, we've sent some questions back to them and they will be giving us presentations 
starting next Thursday on uh, October 28th, the November 4th and November 10th. Um, so uh, I think, I'm trying to remember what we had last year. I think it was more like 14. So maybe a couple more applications this go around. So um, looking forward to, uh, to hearing these proposals. Great. I have uh, no report on the Agricultural Commission tonight. Uh, Tom, how about the DRB? Um, yeah, we had a very active uh, signage review last week. Um, Arigato Japanese restaurant uh, downtown is putting up some new signage and they've done some uh, window work. Um, there is a new lingerie shop, Art of Intimates, um, that is opened up downtown as well that has a storefront near um, Lime Red. So we reviewed their new um, facade. There is a new rice, uh, Asian rice restaurant um, on Boltwood that we looked at some signage and wayfinding for. And then there uh, as well on Boltwood, there is a new, um, what is it? It's like a nightclub. Um, <clears throat> has multiple indoor and outdoor places. Um, within it, uh, again, in the sort of back area of Boltwood. Um, so we looked at some of those signs that were also approved with recommendations. And then lastly, we looked at some signage for a dog park um, in the professional research area uh, off of Route 9 um, by Amherst Woods. So, um, so yeah, lots of signage, um, nothing that seems too crazy, but just checking boxes and making sure everyone's in line. So yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Uh, Chris, the CRC. So I don't think we've met with the CRC for a while. They had a few other things that they were working on and um, but they are having a meeting next week which has two public hearings in it. Um, and those are for the rezoning of the parcel behind CVS and for the uh, mixed use building revisions. So um, we'll be attending those meetings. Other than that, I don't really have anything to report on the CRC. Okay. Oh, those meetings I think I mentioned were two o'clock in the afternoon. So if you wanna come, don't come at night. Okay. Okay. Um, and as for a report of the chair, I really don't have any, anything yet to talk about. Uh, Report of staff, Chris. I have Andy. nothing further. Okay. All right, so the time is 1014 uh, and it looks like we can adjourn. Thank you all for your time and thank the public for uh, sitting Good in night. with us for this long meeting and for your comments. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good Thanks night. everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Recording. Are you sure you like to stop the recording?